The Date Mistake, Do Over Date Series, Book 9. By Susan Hatler. Chapter 1. To say that I'd agreed to this blind date would be a bit of a stretch. I could think of more accurate ways to describe what had happened, manipulated into a blind date, guilt-tripped into a blind date, pestered into a blind date, puppy dog-eyed, or lured into a blind date. Yep, any of those sounded way more accurate for my current situation. If I didn't care about my brother's future happiness, I would regret pulling that little matchmaking stunt that had caused Adrian and Carrie to fall in love, because then Carrie wouldn't feel the need to return the favor and set me up with someone. I yanked a hairbrush through the dark strands of my sleek bob cut with one hand while tugging on a high heel as I hobbled down the busy Sacramento sidewalk, running late to this blind date. They say that when it rains it pours and, for me, they apparently meant it literally, even though rain felt like a rarity in sunny Sacramento. So, this obligation thing I really didn't want to do also required that I hold an umbrella. If only I had three hands. My running late issue technically started last night when I cupped my alarm in my hands, trying to decide whether I wanted to hit the gym before work or sleep in and deal with the guilt over not working out. Always a tough decision. One that had taken too long to make, apparently, because I woke up this morning to an unset alarm sitting on the pillow beside my head. Oops. So, I started my day running 15 minutes late, which had happened way more lately than I'd like to admit. Due to being late, I missed a call with an international art dealer and a call from my dad regarding the high-priority acquisition of a local boutique art auction house called a Keating, and my dad left a message stressing the importance that I meet with the owner today to reel her in. No notice for a pitch today? No pressure, or anything. After tending to crisis after crisis all day in the office, I scarfed down a croissant and a latte from Courtney Carmichael's coffee cart since I'd skipped lunch, and then hurried to my car to squeeze in the initial must-do-today meeting over drinks with Alexandra Keating before the thing I really didn't want to do. The fact that there was no time to have this date hurt my brain but cancelling wasn't an option since Carrie had set it up and I didn't have my blind date's phone number. Knowing I needed to stay calm, I tried to focus on wooing Alexandra Keating as fast as possible since I basically needed to be in two places at once. When I arrived at the Jeffreys Hotel swanky cocktail lounge and saw Alexandra waiting at the bar in her stylish black turtleneck and colorful glasses, I immediately stopped in my tracks and started second-guessing what I'd planned to pitch to her. Yeah, I'd made it there on time, but my overactive mind kept launching horrifying scenarios in which my wording would cause Alexandra to storm away without agreeing to sell her business to the Maxwell House, which would be all my fault and my dad would forever see it as a mistake to have made me CEO. If Alexandra Keating rejected me, she would likely sell her boutique to Rothley's Auction House, our biggest competitor, and no matter what achievements I may or may not make for the rest of my time as CEO of the Maxwell House I would always be a failure. A terrible, horrible failure. I couldn't let my dad down after I'd finally proved that I was ready to be in charge of the family business, could I? No, not an option. Since this promotion, my nerves had been in a constant state of frazzlement. Was frazzlement even a word? If not, it should be. Calm down, Martina. You're smart and qualified and everything will be fine. Just fine. Yeah, tell that to my racing heart. Since I felt like I might pass out, which would not exactly evoke confidence as a solid buyer, I decided to take a lap around the block to calm my nerves before going into the lounge. One block did absolutely nothing to help, so I power walked two, then three, and when I'd finally built up the nerve to go into the lounge, the bar stool was empty. Oh, no. Alexandra Keating was gone. I thrust the heel of my hand to my forehead, wondering how to tell my dad that I'd stood up the owner of the boutique I needed to acquire. Not good, Martina. Not good. Knowing I would have a lot of explaining to do tomorrow, I made a mad dash to my car, rifled through the glove compartment for a phone charger, realized I'd left the phone charger at the office since I hadn't been able to decide whether or not I'd need it, played the high-stakes game of driving in traffic as it started to rain, suffered the horror of finding street parking downtown, pulled out my umbrella, 
applied lipstick in my window reflection along the sidewalk and then raced past the restaurant. Oops, going too fast, hurried back to the restaurant while fanning my armpits with my clutch and strode into the restaurant gracefully like there had never been a cloud in any sky, because everything was fine. Well, if you didn't count my racing pulse. I set my umbrella in a bin just inside the front door and then pulled out my cell phone so I could check Carrie's email to figure out what my blind date looked like, but just as I started to type on the screen it suddenly went black, leaving me staring at my wide-eyed reflection. If it had been a catch-a-break kind of day, I would have looked up to see a mostly empty restaurant and a handsome man sitting alone at the bar who would turn to smile and wave at me as I entered. Instead, I looked up to find the restaurant absolutely packed. This wouldn't have been such an issue if I could remember the description of what my date looked like, but without the ability to check my email on my cell phone I didn't have those pertinent little details. With a frown, I glanced at my phone to see if it had changed its mind about helping me, it hadn't, and then I started to push my way through the crowd. Since taking over my dad's position as CEO of the Maxwell House so he could retire, making decisions had slowly, but surely, become more and more difficult for me. I'd always seen myself as a smart, decisive woman, but the pressure to succeed was wearing on me and even something like deciding how to find a blind date in a busy restaurant had somehow become an insurmountable task. Should I just shout out my name? I couldn't shout out my date's name since I didn't remember what it was without that email from Carrie. Also, shouting didn't seem like the best way to start a date. Not that I even had time to date, obviously but didn't I deserve love in my life? I liked to think so, not that my past dating record indicated this would happen. I never seemed to have that elusive feeling about the guys I dated that people say they feel with the one. Should I bother someone for a phone charger so I could call Carrie? And then crawl between people's legs, searching the floor for an outlet? Should I look for a pay phone? I mean, did those even exist anymore? Should I wander around, hoping to find my blind date holding up a piece of paper with my name like they do at the airport for pickups? My mind raced with possibilities as I spun around in the middle of small clusters of business people having cocktails. Suddenly, someone shouted, coming through, and I turned toward the loud voice too quickly because I stumbled into a server who was hoisting a tray. I immediately bounced off the waiter and pitched toward the floor, thinking, if only I'd set my alarm. Or, maybe I'd said that aloud. In any event, I was clearly going down. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the impact and the inevitable ambulance ride but then strong arms caught me before I hit the ground. What the? My eyes flew open and I blinked several times, before confirming I was being held securely in someone's very solid arms. I glanced up at my savior. Wow, your eyes, I blurted. The man with the amazing blue eyes studied me a moment. You all right? I, um, I continued to blink, making my first decisive decision in weeks, I didn't want this guy to move an inch. It felt good being held in his arms. I felt safe here and the whole world stopped. My heart fluttered at the closeness of his face to mine and I liked the way his blue eyes sparkled as he stared down at me, the corners of his eyes crinkling in amusement. I also liked. What took you so long? he asked, interrupting my thoughts. My eyebrows came together. You were waiting for me? Yes, I've been waiting for you, he said, the corner of his mouth lifting. My whole life, in fact. I'm sorry. I said, feeling bad for being late as I stared up at the handsome man who had apparently had the organization and forethought to memorize my name and physical description. Nice qualities in a blind date, but Carrie hadn't told me about those deep blue eyes or I would have remembered. I immediately took back all of my grumblings about Carrie forcing me into this date. I mean, I'd just arrived and he'd already saved me from certain death, or at least a bump on the head, and those eyes, wowzers. On the bright side, at least I fell into the right person. All that's left now is to fall in love, he said, winking down at me. My tummy warmed and I laughed. Maybe we should start with a drink? 
He chuckled. Why bother? Let's go straight to City Hall. My cheeks heated after realizing I was actually considering the proposition. But that would be rash. I was not a rash person. In fact, my tendency was to overthink everything, which accounted for my recent anxiety spike. Well, either way you're going to have to lift me upright at some point, I said, regretfully. The corner of his mouth tipped up more. Is that so? Unless you plan to spend the rest of your life holding me. He gripped me tighter. I can think of worse ways to pass the time. Oh, swoon. Despite starting with stress and near disaster, my date seemed off to a good start. People are staring, I said. His gaze darted to the side before returning to me. Who? he asked. All these people, I said, feeling so very comfortable in the stranger's arms. Do you want them to be looking? I asked. Well, of course, he said, the corner of his mouth curving upward. I just rescued a beautiful woman. The whole restaurant should be applauding. Should I check to see if we're making a scene? I asked, lowering my voice. Maybe that would be best, he said, his expression turning serious. Just in case. I dared a quick look around and found a few curious eyes glancing in our direction. Hmm. Not good, he said. Definitely not the whole restaurant, I said, wrinkling my nose. And definitely no applause, I'm afraid. Disappointing, he said, shaking his head. Maybe this happens all the time here, I said, my back still arched and the toe of my right shoe pointing up toward the gilded ceiling, while suspended in this man's arm as if he dipped me while dancing. He twisted his mouth as if in deep thought and then I yelped when he swiftly pulled me upright, twirled me around like we were on a dance floor in a ballroom instead of a packed restaurant, and then lifted me up and set me onto the seat of a high-backed barstool. Well, if this is par for the course, he said, leaning over the bar and attempting to flag down the bartender. I'll just have to try harder. I laughed. Is that so? I refuse to be a mediocre date, he said, resting an arm against the shiny wooden bar top and smiling at me. He had tousled blonde hair that looked windswept, as if he'd spent his afternoon spinning me around, dipping me low, before looking at me with those eyes. What do you have in mind to step up your game? I asked, scooting against the back of the high-backed stool. Oh, you know, he said, shrugging, maybe a dramatic pronouncement of love from up on the bar here. That's it? I asked, enjoying this game. I was just getting started, he said, lifting a hand toward the bartender again. Then I'll gather the candles from every table in the restaurant so I can spell your name on the floor, call you a horse-drawn carriage to take you for a ride around the park, and perhaps a nightcap on the terrace of the Jeffreys Hotel. Things like that. Am I improving at all? If that's a first date, sign me up for the second, I said, relaxing for the first time in months as he finally caught the attention of the bartender. His blue-eyed gaze caught mine. Champagne? Why not? I said, deciding this was a champagne kind of date. And to think I'd wanted to cancel. Turned out that this whimsical man was just what I needed to light me up again inside. We'd like two glasses of your finest champagne please, he said. The bartender nodded, reached into the fridge under the bar, and then I heard a loud pop. As he poured two flutes to the top with bubbly liquid, I noticed the Dom Perignon label on the bottle. Impressive. My family drank Dom on New Year's and I loved it. Should I admit something to you? I asked. If it's that you don't actually like champagne, I'll be disappointed. I love champagne, I assured him. In that case, the wedding is still on, he said. I smiled. I don't know your name. He raised an eyebrow. A brave thing to admit. I'm sorry, I said, 
shaking my head slowly. It's been a rush kind of day for me and I tried to check my email when I arrived but my phone died. I see, he said, raising his eyebrows and looking slightly confused before his mouth curved upward again. What would you like my name to be? A guessing game? You'd better not wait on me, I said, holding my palms up. We'll be here until the place closes. I've had trouble making even the smallest decisions lately. Wait, had I actually admitted my weakness aloud to a virtual stranger? Well, not a total stranger since Carrie knew him from her store, Carrie's kaleidoscope. I'd have to ask her what he'd bought. In fact, I wanted to know everything about him. What was it about this guy that made me feel so at ease? My blood pressure had to be almost in the normal range right now. Your admission is honest and refreshing, he said, scooting his barstool closer until his knee brushed against mine. Let's get to know everything about each other tonight, starting with the first words we ever spoke. Wait, if we start that far back then they'll be chasing us out of here before we even get to the second grade. How fast can you talk? I laughed. Maybe I'll call you Casanova. I've never met a man more charming. This is a good thing, he said with a determined nod. And you'll be Polaris, because I've been searching the night sky for you. A little cheesy, but I like it, I said, as my date, my Casanova, handed me a flute. He raised his glass toward mine and our gazes locked and held, my grin mirroring his as if by some spell. My tummy did a cartwheel. To Casanova and Polaris, he said grandly, to their fortuitous meeting, to their magical evening, to their forever and ever. I clinked my glass against his. To all of that. I always thought they called it a blind date because you knew nothing going in and would just have to feel your way in the dark and hope for the best. But, clearly, I was wrong. They called it a blind date because by total accident and by total surprise you can be set up with someone so bright, so wonderful, so warm that it's like staring at the direct sun. Smiling at Casanova, I raised my glass to my lips to take a sip and... Excuse me? Are you Martina Maxwell? A man asked, stopping beside me before I was able to sip that delicious champagne. I'm sorry? I asked. You're Martina, right? He asked. The bubbly liquid fell back into the glass as I straightened the flute. Yes. Ah, good, he said, blowing out a breath. I had to call Carrie to have her tell me what you looked like. She did a subpar job describing you actually. Though she said you'd be wearing a suit and I'd say that's more of a heavy cardigan. And she said your hair was black and really I'm getting more of a dark brown vibe and I don't really see the freckles she was talking about but maybe it's just the lighting in here. But that's all right now that I've found you in. I'm sorry, I said, holding up my palm. Who are you? The man puffed up his chest and stretched up onto his toes, seeming to gain an inch or two of height as Casanova watched him curiously. You know who I am, he said, with slight annoyance in his tone. I'm your blind date. My jaw dropped as I looked from Casanova to this man and then back again as it all clicked. The perfect man who I thought Carrie had set me up with was actually a complete and total stranger? My stomach sank. I really and truly should have set my alarm last night. Chapter 2 I stared at the man who claimed to be my blind date, feeling like I'd been dropped into some kind of alternate universe. The best date of my life and the first time I'd felt like myself since becoming CEO had not been with my arranged blind date. This did not compute. I'm sorry. I said, shaking my head and taking a long sip of champagne before setting the glass down on the bar top. I'd obviously heard this man incorrectly. Who are you again? I'm your blind date, he said, tucking his chin so severely that it disappeared into his neck just above his polka dot bow tie. I texted you that I'd be about 30 minutes late. Well, it turns out to be 33 minutes late exactly. Though, Admittedly, 
It's now been 34 minutes since I had such difficulty finding you. But, in all fairness, I think we should consider my initial estimation pretty accurate given the particulars at play in. You're saying that you are my date, I said, blinking at him. Well, who else? he said, looking confused. I spun in the barstool to face the man I'd been flirting with for approximately 34 minutes, it appeared, the man who had saved me from falling, who had made me laugh and swoon, and who had impeccable taste in champagne. I tossed back the last of the delicious liquid, trying to wrap my head around what was happening right now. I stared into those magnetic blue eyes. And who are you? Casanova, he said, with an easy, playful grin. My finger pointed at Mr. Bowtie. And you are. As I said, your date, he said, giving Casanova an annoyed look. I'm not sure why there is confusion here. This was prearranged. Uh huh, I said, feeling more than a little disappointed that Casanova wasn't my date and that Mr. Bowtie was my date because, well, he wasn't Casanova. I glanced at the bartender, holding up my index finger. Another champagne, please. The bartender nodded, pouring a new glass and setting it in front of me before slipping the empty glass away. More champagne was definitely needed right now. I took a sip. You're Casanova, I said. The man's blue eyes flashed. Correct. I pointed to my own chest. I'm Martina. Or at least, I think I'm Martina. Maybe I don't know even that anymore. Mr. Bowtie's restless attention had turned to the man with the incredible blue eyes and he stepped toward him, blocking me slightly from view. Sir, may I ask who you are? How rude of me, I said, jumping in before trouble could start. Mr. Bowtie. I mean, to be honest, I guess I don't know your name. Theodore Fulton, of course, he said, giving me a slight nod and then glancing with a quick frown at Casanova before returning his full attention to me. I thought you would know my name since Carrie said she gave you all the details about me. Well, it's a long story, but the gist of it is that my cell phone died and I couldn't access my email. I took another sip of champagne, wishing I'd set that blasted alarm. So, Theodore, I'd like to introduce you to Casa. Wait, I don't know your name either. You know my name, Martina, he said, without taking his eyes from mine despite Theodore's obvious rising irritation. It's not Casanova. What's your real name? I said, realizing how badly I did want to know his name. The corner of his mouth lifted and then he opened his mouth. Turner, a familiar male voice called from behind us. My gaze swiveled in the direction of the shout and my eyes widened as I saw my little brother, Adrian, weaving his way past the bustling table section toward us. Adrian? I asked, as he came toward me. What are you doing here? Hey, Martina, he said, giving me a confused look before he grabbed Casanova in a one-armed embrace that was promptly followed by back thumping. I now had three men here with me. How had that happened? Another guy? Theodore said, obviously surprised by this new addition to our little party as well. Carrie didn't mention any of this. Um, this is my brother, I said, wondering what in the world he was doing here. Theodore's eyes widened. You invited him on our date? Along with this other guy? I didn't invite Casanova, I said, my cheeks heating as I wondered how to remedy the situation. Was it wrong to want to be on a date with a stranger, who wasn't my blind date? And why had he hugged my brother? I mean, I just fell for him. You fell for me? Casanova asked, grinning. Uh, what did you say? Adrian asked. That was going to be my question, Theodore said. I raised both of my palms and shook my head profusely. No, I didn't fall for him. I fell into him. By accident. 
Maybe it was fate, Casanova said, his blue eyes dancing. My belly did a little flip. Those eyes were going to appear in my dreams tonight, no doubt about it. Theodore's brow wrinkled and he took a step back. I'm really confused. Yeah, that made two of us. But I felt bad for the situation since I'd kind of helped create it by tripping and almost falling and being rescued by a handsome stranger. Not that I knew that at the time, but still. I'd be annoyed if I showed up to a blind date, who was with someone else. I lifted my champagne flute, took a long sip and turned to my blind date, er, my real one. When I arrived at the restaurant, I was rushing so I wouldn't be late and the server hoisted a tray and nearly barreled into me. I moved out of the way fast, tripped, and started to fall. I jerked a thumb in Casanova's direction. This guy caught me before I hit the floor. How quickly I went from Casanova to this guy, he said, seeming to find my description amusing. Why did I find that smirk so attractive? That's all that happened? Theodore asked. Yes, I said, realizing I was holding the champagne Casanova had bought me, or at least he'd ordered the first one. I didn't know how to explain that we were drinking some very quality champagne together, so I said, he caught me and held me. I mean, not held me. Held on to me. But then he let go. I mean, obviously he let go. He wasn't going to hold on to me forever. Though he did say, no, wait, that part doesn't matter. Is it hot in here or what? It's weird in here, Adrian said, exchanging a look with Casanova. Um, Theodore, I'd like you to meet my brother, Adrian. His girlfriend, Carrie, is the one who arranged this blind date, I said, grabbing the arm of my brother's suit and pulling him toward me. You are my little brother, aren't you? Last time I checked, he said. Adrian extended his hand to Theodore. Nice to meet you. Likewise, Theodore said. Adrian, how do you know my Cass, er, this guy? I asked, trying to avoid the blue-eyed gaze that I could feel burning into the side of my head. Turner? Adrian asked, slinging his arm around the man's shoulders. Haven't you met Turner before? He's my fraternity brother from college. I stifled a groan as the familiar name rolled through my head. Casanova was my little brother's best friend, Turner? Do you know, Turner? Theodore asked. I've never met him before, I said, just as Turner said, we know each other very well. Not true, I said, shaking my head. Would you like to join us, Martina? Turner asked, completely at ease with the fact that I was now on a date with another man. We can talk business. My eyebrows lifted. Why would we talk business? Turner smiled easily. If you're Adrian's sister then you're the CEO of the Maxwell House, which means you and I want the same thing. I narrowed my eyes. And what is that exactly? A. Keating. A. Keating? Why had he just mentioned the name of the owner of the art auction house that I was supposed to acquire? That made zero sense. I tilted my head. Look, Turner, unless you're the CEO of Rothleys then you don't stand a chance of. Adrian averted his eyes, which caught my attention. Oh, no. I turned my gaze to Turner slowly, my mouth falling open. Turner was beaming, absolutely beaming. Wait, are you the CEO of Rothleys? I asked. Correct, he said, flashing me a sexy grin. My stomach nodded as I stared at the CEO of Rothleys, the Maxwell House's greatest competitor, and racked my brain to find something intimidating to say. Nothing came to mind. Not a single thought to throw at my greatest competitor. In fact, hadn't I just admitted to him that I was having trouble making even the smallest decisions lately? Not good, Martina. So not good. 
I finished off my champagne and stood. Let's get our own table, Theo, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I only go by Theodore, actually, he said, stiffly. Great, my date was going to stay annoyed with me? Could I blame him? Sorry, Theodore, I said, wishing he could have been smooth and relaxed like Turner. Why did I have to have an instant connection with someone so completely wrong for me? While my actual date's stiffness annoyed me. After you, Theodore said, putting a hand on my arm, making me want to cringe. Be seeing you soon, Martina, Turner said, giving me a side glance. Goodbye, Turner, I said, giving Adrian a we'll be talking about this later look. Theodore moved to a nearby table so we could try to save what was left of the state. But as Theodore and I began an awkward conversation, all I could concentrate on was the fact that Turner's gaze kept locking with mine. Finally, I blocked his view with my menu and turned my attention to what my date was saying. Weather vanes are a tricky business, you know, Theodore said, not seeming to notice that my eyes had glazed over as he schooled me on the weather vanes he sold for a living. The wind can blow from the west or from the east or from the north or from the south. And then there are all of the combinations. There's the southwest. And there's the northwest. And there's the... I wriggled in my chair, which gave a loud screech as the legs moved several inches across the floor. Theodore paused, staring at me. Everything okay? Just wanted to get closer to the table, I said, turning the chair so I couldn't catch Turner's eye at all. This way I can focus on our conversation. Don't want to miss a thing you're saying about. Wind. Oh, boy. Yes, the wind. I thought surely Turner's eyes couldn't find me with me in this new position. I thought wrong. Northwest and, wait, did I already say that one? Theodore asked. Yes, there they were those eyes in the dark window reflection. North by Northwest. I couldn't escape those blue eyes. Don't forget about South by Southeast. People tend to forget about South by Southeast. And as my date rattled on about the wind blowing South by Southwest, my mind replayed my conversation with Turner. We'd talked and flirted so easily. When had that ever happened to me in my life with a guy before? Yeah, that would be never. Thinking about Turner was a delicious indulgence that was dangerous for my career and needed to stop. Right now. Chapter 3 On Sunday night, I leaned back into the chair at our favorite Mexican restaurant and played with the pink straw in my margarita as I filled my friends in on my very odd Friday night date. Not only had there been no love connection between Theodore and me, but I had Turner Easton on my mind all weekend. I may have even gone onto the Rothley's Auction House website and read the bio of their very hot CEO a dozen times or more. Seriously, I'd lost count. But Turner was obviously off limits, which was fine because I needed to focus on fixing the mess I'd made with a Keating. I'd left her a message at her office on Friday night, but hadn't heard back yet. Did I mention North by Northwest? I said, as Carrie reached for a third tissue to dry the tears she'd been crying from laughing so hard. Her sister, Tabitha, gripped her sides and begged me to stop relaying this very boring conversation with Theodore that I'd had to endure. Because the wind does, you know, also blow North by Northwest. He didn't say that really, did he? Carrie asked, gasping for breath. Please tell me he didn't list every direction the wind might possibly blow? I don't remember, I said, making a mental note to never let Carrie set me up on a date ever again. He might have forgotten to mention plain old Northeast in all his excitement. Tabitha's black eyeliner had streaked down her cheeks as she dabbed at her leaking eyes. Carrie, she exclaimed, elbowing her older sister. What were you thinking setting Martina up with that guy? I thought he was nice, Carrie said, defending herself from behind the protection of a giant frozen mango margarita. 
We sell his weather vanes and carries kaleidoscope and he's always been very normal when he comes to drop off inventory. I narrowed my eyes and pointed an accusatory finger at Carrie. You hesitated. She raised both arms. I didn't. I turned to Tabitha for backup. She nodded. You definitely hesitated, Carrie. Carrie stirred her straw around in her drink. Now that you mention it, Theodore does tend to get a bit chatty. Chatty? I said, lifting a chip and dipping into the guacamole. Is that what you call how he goes over every little detail about nothing? Carrie set her drink on an adorable little cacti napkin and then crossed her arms over her chest indignantly. What? Are you going to revoke my blind date setting up card? Tabitha only made more of a mess out of her bold eyeliner as she snorted and dragged her fingers under her eyes. Yes, I said, pointing a chip at Carrie. That's exactly what I'm doing. No more blind dates. Carrie dragged her chair up close to the colorful Mexican tablecloth and reached across the array of drinks and dips and quesadillas and fried ice creams toward me. But, Martina, just listen, she said, a smile forming on her face. I have this other artist friend, Julian. He makes hand-painted jigsaw puzzles and he doesn't say a word. Not a word. Tabitha broke out into a whole new series of tear-inducing giggles. Do it, Martina. I want to hear about the date with the quiet guy next. No more blind dates, I said, waving my hands as if to finish the subject entirely. Work is already stressful enough without throwing mute puzzle makers into the mix. If I don't land the A. Keating acquisition, especially with Rothlis now interested, too, I don't know what will happen. My head fell to my chest and I sighed loudly. Do you want another drink? Tabitha asked, reaching over to place a reassuring hand on my shoulder. Yes, I said, noting my glass was almost empty. Wait, no. I should get back to my computer. I mean, yes, it's Sunday evening and I need to relax. Tabitha hesitated. So, yes? No, I said, shaking my head. No, I need to focus. Okay. No, wait, yes. I deserve to relax a little. I want another. No, I don't. Yes. No. Arg. Laughing, Tabitha squeezed my shoulder. Martina, you're so tense. I tried to laugh casually as I sat back and smiled at my friends, but truthfully my back hurt, tight as it was like a drawn bow. I was somehow both tired and restless. I felt exhausted and I also knew it would take me hours to fall asleep. My brain had a million thoughts flying through it every minute and yet they may as well have been planes whizzing by overhead because I couldn't latch onto a single one. I was working harder than ever, but I seemed to be getting less done. Something needed to change. I mean, you two must be tense, right? I said, accepting Tabitha's kindly offered beer bottle and lime. Carrie, you're driving back and forth all the time between your shop in Blue Moon Bay and the store here in Sacramento, bringing in new products and drumming up new business. It's a lot, Carrie said, seeming to think about it. And, Tabitha, you're managing the Sacramento store full-time and that must be a lot of stress to take on with how busy the city can get. I'm sure you both feel tense like me, right? I looked between the two sisters, first at Carrie with her long, dark hair and her flowy blouse. Then I glanced at Tabitha, with her hair twisted up into two buns stabbed with chopsticks and an old pair of tie-dye overalls. Neither looked the way I felt, about to crack. Actually, we've both been pretty good about finding ways to de-stress, Carrie said, nudging her margarita through the maze of salsas in the middle of the table as I'd sipped on Tabitha's beer bottle. Adrian and I go paddle boarding most mornings when we're in Blue Moon Bay. Exercise is a great stress reliever. 
I do yoga four to five times a week, Tabitha said, pressing her palms together in the prayer position. Hot yoga, aromatherapy yoga, sunrise yoga, sunset yoga, goat yoga. I choked on my drink. Goat yoga? Seriously? Oh, goat yoga's the best, Tabitha said, nodding. You must do something to relax, Carrie said, as she cracked her spoon against the fried ice cream. She frowned when I remained silent. Martina? I'm thinking, I said, and suddenly our little terrace table overlooking the square was silent except for the Spanish music from the old stereo back in the tiny kitchen. Hello? Martina? Carrie said, again. Do you meditate? Tabitha asked, reaching for the quesadillas. I listen to meeting transcriptions, I said, tilting my head. Does that count? No, Carrie and Tabitha said at the same time. What about long walks? Tabitha asked. I shrugged. It's kind of a long walk from my office to the conference room. Are you ever just totally immersed in nature? Tabitha asked. I squeezed one eye shut. The pigeons outside my bedroom can get pretty noisy, I guess. Oh, Martina, Carrie said, shaking her head. Acupuncture? Tabitha asked, not quite ready to give up on me it seemed. No, I said, shaking my head. Bubble bath with candles? I blew out a noisy breath. Who has time for that? A favorite book curled up on the couch? Carrie asked. I stuck up a finger at that one. How about reading a quarterly report while sitting up straight in an ergonomic desk chair? Tabitha laughed and reached over again to squeeze my knotted shoulder. That's your problem, Martina. You need to relax. I never said I had a problem, I grumbled, even though I absolutely had a stress issue. Other than Theodore Fulton, maybe. You couldn't even decide if you wanted a second drink, girl, Carrie said, reminding me. Don't you think that stress might be affecting your work as CEO? Which might be making you even more stressed, Tabitha added. I drummed my fingers against the stem of Carrie's margarita and considered what my friends were saying. If relaxing and de-stressing meant winning the bid for a Keating then it might be worth exploring. So, you're saying I need a relaxation scheme? A relaxation operation? A relaxation enterprise? I rubbed at my throbbing temples. What should I call it? Just relaxation, Martina, Carrie said, her voice gentle. I need to create a plan, I said, already picturing the colorful sticky notes I would need for brainstorming. With actionable steps, accountability milestones and progress trackers, and… I think you're missing the point, Tabitha said, but the wheels on Operation Relaxation were already turning at full speed. I should get to the office, I said, pushing back my chair suddenly. It will probably take all night to get the system in place, so I should start right away. Martina! Tabitha cried. I shrugged. Sorry, but between the research and... Martina! Carrie called after me. And the viability testing. Martina, they both shouted, but I was already hurrying down the stairs. I was going to relax. I was going to de-stress. Even if it killed me. The benefit of having a favorite coffee cart in the city, aka, Courtney Michaels coffee cart, with a favorite coffee cart barista, aka, Courtney, was that on those mornings where I had to have my nose buried in my phone for business, my order still appeared on the colorful Hawaiian-themed counter like magic without my having to say a word. I was putting the final touches on Operation Relaxation and my fingers flew across the keypad like pigeons over a handful of seeds. Busy morning? Courtney asked. Oh, you have no idea. 
I glanced up from my synced online doc on my phone to see what Courtney looked like this bright, sunny Monday morning, another Hawaiian shirt, a lay of fresh flowers she grew herself, cheap gas station sunglasses from one of her frequent road trips around the state, and a beaming smile like a blue sky that never, ever saw a cloud except for the fluffiest white ones. I've got you covered, Courtney said, as she brewed the third shot of espresso for my usual caffeine-packed drink. You're a lifesaver, I said, my gaze falling back onto my cell phone screen. Business again? Courtney asked, turning up the radio as a favorite song of hers started to play, though I wasn't sure there wasn't an upbeat, positive song that wasn't Courtney's favorite. The business of relaxation, I said, anguishing over whether a colon or a semicolon was appropriate for a sentence in stage 6, part 9, subsection C of Operation Relaxation. I decided to just make a note to consult a grammar guide once I was back at my desk and moved on to edit stage 6 part 9, subsection D. Bit of an oxymoron, don't you think, my friend? She asked, while snapping and humming and doing a quick spin by her grass umbrella-covered coffee cart before getting back to the business of frothing the milk. Absolutely not, I said, staring at my phone. If you want to relax, you've got to get serious about it. You've got to have a plan. You can't just rush into relaxing, Courtney. My old friend laughed and I bit my lip as the question of the font came lurching back into my mind like a scary clown that was supposed to be dead in a horror movie but was most definitely alive. I knew a font could make or break a plan, hold your interest or make you glance away. I rubbed my forehead as the indecision made my stomach hurt and my palms clammy. Maybe if you put your phone down for a second or two you might see there are plenty of reasons to relax all around you, Courtney said, holding her arms wide as she stepped back. The sun. The friendly faces. The. My plan is on my phone, I said, picking a font, second-guessing the font and then changing the font before changing it again. And if you were to just set aside your plan for a moment, what would happen? Courtney asked, whipped cream canister held suspended over my drink like my answer determined how much extra I would get. Although, Courtney always gave extra whipped cream. She was an extra whipped cream kind of person ever since she quit practicing law 24-7 because her husband left her saying she was a workaholic. Having lost her partner, she decided from that day forward she'd enjoy life, so she quit her high-paying, high-powered job and bought the coffee cart. I don't see how I'm going to avoid mistakes without a plan, I said, bringing my phone even closer to my face to squint against the glare of the sun. Courtney sighed and slid my drink toward me. She went to add a decorative little paper umbrella, but hesitated and then added another twist of whipped cream. Sorry, Courtney, I said, knowing she was only trying to be kind. I'll be better once this relaxation plan is in action, you know? Once I'm de-stressed then we can chat and enjoy the sunshine and maybe have some of that Kahlua I know you keep down there for rainy days. Courtney laughed. I think you might have it backwards, my friend. But I was wrangling with trying goat yoga or hot yoga first and barely heard her. What's that? I asked distractedly. Courtney reached out to pat my shoulder. You'll find out soon enough. I was about to leave, fingers already wrapped around that precious, can't live life without coffee cup when I stopped and turned back, my phone guiding me like a leash. Hey, how's the new pup? I asked. Atticus? Oh, happy, healthy, and high maintenance. You should bring him around again, I said, since I loved Courtney's little rescue puppy. She brought him to the cart often, which was fun. He's here, Martina. But, again, I didn't hear her, because I was so preoccupied with Operation Relaxation. Yeah, yeah, I said, waving goodbye with my elbow like a bird's crooked wing. Bring him next time for sure. Man, I thought as I walked up to my office, my nose still buried in my phone. Playing with Atticus for a few minutes really would have been a great start to Operation Relaxation. Chapter 4. 
My assistant buzzed my office to announce that my 10 o'clock meeting had arrived and I told her to bring the person in without even bothering to ask who it was since I didn't even remember scheduling an appointment this morning. I'd spent all night working on Operation Relaxation and I was just putting the finishing touches on what seemed to be a brilliant and well-thought-out plan. Soon, I would be curling up on couches with books, waltzing through flower gardens, balancing goats on my downward-facing dog, and acquiring a Keating for the Maxwell House. Right now, I put into effect stage one of my plan to relax, de-stress, and win but within five seconds someone appeared in my doorway and my heart rate leaped, my hands tightened into clenched fists, and my cheeks burned at the very sight of my ten o'clock meeting. Sally! I said, calling to my assistant, and even going so far as to stand and lean precariously over my cluttered desk. Sally! Turner leaned casually against the door jam and thumbed down the hallway. Should I go and get her for you? he asked, an amused grin playing on his lips. Yes, I said, avoiding those beautiful eyes. Please get her and tell her that there is an unwanted guest in the building. An unwanted guest, he said, his tone upbeat. Yes, please tell her I would suggest security be called promptly. Are we in danger? he asked, looking down the hallway and clutching his chest. The corner of my mouth twitched as I eyed him from head to toe. He looked casually cool in his trim, dark suit and classic white sneakers. He swung black aviators from his tanned fingers and dragged a hand through that perfectly tousled blonde hair. Yes, I said, sinking back into my office chair and covering my eyes with my hand. I think we're very much in danger. From a crack between my fingers, I watched Turner close the door and lock it. We'll be safe in here, I think, he said as he moved toward my desk looking comfortable as if this were his office. From this dangerous, unwanted guest. Wherever he might be lurking. Or she. Definitely he, I said, folding my hands and placing them on the desk. Glad we have that straight, he said, leaning back in his chair and propping his foot over the opposite knee. Can I help you? I asked, shuffling papers to show that I was a very busy woman. I have quite a lot to do. As you can imagine, acquiring a boutique art auction house is fairly involved. With a little chuckle, Turner picked up a picture frame I'd received as a gift from Adrian when I'd been named CEO of the Maxwell House six months ago. I hadn't been able to decide which photo to put in it so the stock photo still smiled back at me day in and day out. The resemblance is uncanny, Turner said, holding the frame next to my face. Your sister? The picture was an 80-year-old black woman with her cat. I snatched the frame from him and shoved it into a random drawer. What do you want, Turner? I asked, crossing my arms over my chest. Well, it's simple, pull. Polly? Polaris, he said, as if the word were obvious. That was the name we decided for you, was it not? All of that was under false pretense, I said, wagging a finger at him. You made me think you were my blind date, which you weren't, and so anything I may or may not have said must therefore be stricken entirely from the record. Turner stretched his arms back to weave his long fingers behind his head. I bit back an exacerbated sigh at his easy, casual body language. Why was I over here feeling like a piece of taffy stretched too thin and left to dry out on the boardwalk when he looked so chill? Polly, 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 he said, clicking his tongue and shaking his head. You've got it all wrong. I didn't make you think anything. I'm the injured party here. I laughed, throwing my hands into the air. How do you figure? The way I see it, he said, remaining calm as he touched his hand to his broad chest. I was duped by you into believing you were mine for the night. I had no knowledge, nor could I have had any knowledge, of this supposed blind date you were meeting. All I had to go on was a woman who smiled when I smiled. It's not my fault you have a nice smile, I pointed out. The way I see it, I was robbed of a date, he said, leaning forward and putting his forearms on his knees. 
The way I see it, darling, is that you owe me a date. I stared at him with my mouth hanging open. No, you tricked me. He smiled. You said you were waiting for me. I asked if you were waiting for me. You said you fell into the right person. Because I thought you were my blind date, I said, reminding him of that little fact. You said we were going to talk all night long. No, you said that. You didn't disagree, he said, raising a finger. I gripped at my hair. You are ruining my operation. His mouth turned downward. Operation? Are you all right? I meant operation as in a plan, I said, feeling badly that I seemed to have worried him. I forgive you, he said, clearly moving back to our previous banter. Just go on a date with me and we're square. I flopped over my desk with a groan and just so happened to smack my cheek against my operation relaxation binder. A grin tugged at the corners of my lips. I pulled myself up and straightened my shoulders in the chair. I'm afraid I can't go on a date with you. Casanova. Turner Easton, I said, rolling my eyes. Ah, sweetie, you looked up my full name, he said. I cringed, hating that he'd caught me. Only for work purposes, I lied. What else did you learn, he asked, looking very pleased with himself. I learned that blind dates are not a good idea, I said, waving my hand dismissively. I'm on a very strict plan to de-stress in you, I'm sorry to say, are the very definition of stress. He mocked offense. Me? Stressful? How? How? I asked, letting out a little laugh. How about we start with the fact that you're my little brother's best friend? That's a plus, as I see it, he said, tapping his finger to his temple. We can each tell him how we thought our date went and he can compare notes. Let's not forget you're the CEO of a rival company, I said, getting to the heart of the matter, because I might be able to work around the brother thing. Maybe. Another important thing is that you're here to steal a Keating from me. He shook his head. Friendly competition is good for couples. I read some study some. And, most importantly of all, it's just you, I said, as if the matter were closed. You are stressful. Why? Turner asked, smiling. I frowned. How could I tell him those eyes were haunting me? How could I say that his humor and smile were comforting in a way I'd never known before? I had a million reasons, but not like I could say any of those. Because, well, just because. Now if you don't mind, I said, gesturing toward the door. He studied me with that stupid grin. How did your blind date go? He asked. Out, I said, pointing toward the door. He stood and hesitated at the front of my desk. No date right now? No date. You're sure? Very. I tried to keep my focus on a report, but found myself glancing toward Turner as he walked toward the door. I'll keep my eye out for that unwanted guest, he said, ducking his head back inside and winking. Especially if he's as dangerous as you say. Then the door clicked shut and I shook my head. I had no idea just how dangerous Turner Easton would be to me, but he was most definitely stressful. A date? He wanted a date with me? Very inconvenient since every part of me wanted to say yes, which was not going to work since we were the CEOs of rival companies. Obviously, I'd never date Turner. I didn't care. I did. Not. Care. Oh, man, I hated that I couldn't even convince myself. I picked up the phone and buzzed my assistant. Hi, Sally. Please call a Keating's office and insist on a meeting today. I don't care what time or what I have to cancel. Thank you. 
Chapter 5 On Tuesday evening, I put Operation Relaxation into action. I started with the whole bath thing first, drawing a hot tub of water, but that got me worrying about the steam affecting my wallpaper. I spent the next 15 minutes checking all the corners of the beautiful floral print paper for potential peeling and by the time I was ready to drop my robe and slip into the tub the water had grown tepid. Ugh. I swirled my fingers around the lukewarm water, wondering if I should get in and noting the bath bomb hadn't really exploded, but had kind of fallen apart into chunks that bobbed lazily along the surface and reminded me of shark fins. Needless to say, Thinking about Jaws didn't create a calming or relaxing environment for me. Determined to achieve my operation relaxation plan, I stepped into the water, leaned back against the tub and waited for the stress to dissipate. The rose petals I'd tossed in clung to my skin like leeches and the bath pillow I bought was sliding down the surface so now my head was halfway under, which felt just a little too close to drowning to fully relax. The supposedly calming scent of my sandalwood candle hadn't reached my brain yet, because all I could think about were ideas on how best to pitch the Maxwell House to Alexandra Keating. As a result, I did a lot of thrashing my head back and forth and so instead of tucking myself into bed early after my bath, I stayed up drying the soaked wood floors with my hair dryer, which as everyone knows, has a very soothing sound. But that didn't work either. So, the next morning I arrived to a Keating Art Auction Boutique downtown to meet with Alexandra Keating feeling more exhausted and stressed than ever. Again, I am so sorry about the mix-up the other day, I said, my toe tapping uncontrollably so that the teacup on my knee rattled against the saucer. I can assure you that we adhere to the strictest standards of professionalism at the Maxwell House. Alexandra set her teacup down on a beautiful antique side table next to her with a tired sigh and took off her oversized tortoise shell glasses. Yes, she said, as she cleaned them against her black turtleneck. I do believe you've said that several times. I laughed nervously. Well, I'll say it again, if you'd like. No, Alexandra said, curtly. An awkward silence that made me sweat settled over us. I busied myself with admiring the grand display room at a Keating. High, carved ceilings. Warm wood panels. Paintings illuminated by soft light. Oriental rugs helped create an environment that was both exquisite and welcoming. I knew every piece of furniture, art, decor, and light fixture had been selected by Alexandra. She had a reputation in the art community as caring deeply about every piece she sold. When I'd eyed just about every nook and cranny and couldn't stand the silence any longer, I cleared my throat and nodded toward the business proposal I'd brought, which Alexandra had not even bothered to open. Ms. Keating. I've told you to call me Alexandra. Alexandra, I said, though the woman prickled nonetheless. As you'll see in the proposal, the Maxwell House is offering more than you'll get from anyone else. No one can match the package we're willing to provide in order to acquire a Keating. Frankly, it's the most lucrative offer you'll receive because we value your auction house. Alexandra replaced her glasses and studied me, her hands clasped over her knee. Clearing my throat, I said, I can bring over the papers to sign this afternoon if. Martina. Alexandra said, taking a deep breath. You do understand that the most important thing for me is that a Keating goes to a place with the right fit, correct? Yes, I said, gesturing perhaps a little too emphatically. There is no better fit than the Maxwell House. As you'll see in that document there, all the numbers add up and... Have you heard of Rothley's? Alexandra asked, her finger tracing the saucer. My stomach dropped. Yes, of course, I said, my throat constricting. Are you familiar with their CEO, Turner Easton? Warmth heated my cheeks as I shook my head. No, I wouldn't say familiar. Why would you say familiar? She regarded me with an eyebrow raised slightly above her oversized frames. I met with him yesterday and, frankly, he seems a better, fit. I fumbled with my teacup as I tried to keep my cool. 
You think Turner Easton is a better fit than me? I sputtered. She nodded. You're thinking of selling a Keating to him? She shrugged. It's a matter of fit, Martina. My teacup and saucer clattered noisily as I set them down on the side table with shaky hands. I pushed myself to my feet. Would you please excuse me a minute? She gave me an odd look but agreed. I hurried outside and dialed the number Adrian had given me. Turner Easton, he said, when he answered. What did you offer her? I said, as I stalked back and forth on the sidewalk outside the boutique. Polly, is that you? Turner asked. It's Martina, I said, hating how the sound of his voice did crazy things to my belly. How much did you lowball me by? I know Rothlis doesn't have the capital to outbid me. Have you changed your mind about our date? No, I said, staring at my phone momentarily before putting it back to my ear. This guy was ruining my career and reputation with my dad and he wanted a date. No way. I want answers, Turner. I like the way you say my name, he said, and I could practically hear the smile on his handsome face. If we could get together, you could ask me anything you want. Like a business meeting? I asked, chewing my bottom lip. Surely, a business meeting wouldn't go against Operation Relaxation. Sure, he said, his tone amused. Like a business date. You mean a business meeting? I said firmly into the phone. What did I say? A date. He laughed. A date? Well, if you insist. No, no, you said. I'll pick you up at eight, he said, and then the line went dead. He was gone before I could tell him this was to be in no way, shape, or form a date. He knew that, though, right? Either way, I hung up my phone and went to my business meeting because a meeting with a colleague or rival was in no way a date. Chapter 6 that evening, for my business meeting with Turner, we sat across from one another at an intimate corner table on the terrace of the Jeffreys Hotel at their finest restaurant. The table was set with a white linen cloth, a flickering candle, and two glasses of bubbling champagne. The glass walls of the terrace railing only enhanced the candles and the clear twilight sky with its bold strokes of pink, orange, and red lingering in the coming darkness. Soft music from a string quartet wafted toward us along with the intoxicating scent of fresh herbs, bread, and unrestrained heaps of butter. This little space for two promised never-empty glasses, delicious food, long conversations, hands held in candlelight, and a manager at the end of the night softly whispering that the restaurant had, unfortunately, long ago closed. As we regretfully stood, our gazes would meet and then we would lean toward each other in an unforgettable and lingering kiss. I shook my head to break out of my trance. This is so not right, I said, blowing out the candle at the center of our table. The candle wasn't right? Turner asked, his forehead wrinkling in confusion. No, it's not right at all, I said, just as a uniformed server discreetly relit the candle. After he had disappeared, I leaned toward my dinner companion. Business meetings need garish fluorescent lights and conference rooms. Business meetings should not have candle light. I blew out the candle again to make my point. Moments later, a different server appeared and relit it. Shaking my head, I gestured at the absolutely stunning view, not helped at all by perhaps what had been the prettiest of sunsets I'd seen that year, which, admittedly wasn't many since I spent most sunsets holed up in my office at work. Would you like me to request a table with fluorescent lighting? Turner asked, the corners of his mouth twitching. That's very amusing considering you picked this location, I said, trying to ignore the magnetic pull of his eyes. I could seriously get lost in the deep shades of blue. A business meeting should have solid walls, not an open-air view of downtown. It's a beautiful view, isn't it? Gorgeous, I said 
because it really was breathtaking. But not appropriate, Turner, and you know it. Who should I ask to shut off the sunset, he asked, pulling out his cell phone. The mayor? I'll send her a strongly worded email right this moment. Ma'am, this sunset just will not do for my date. I'm not your date. I rolled my eyes, nudging aside the silverware and plate to make room for my briefcase, which I laid on the table. I did, however, take a quick sip of champagne. I mean, it would be a shame to let it go to waste. A business meeting needs table space. How are we supposed to conduct business like this? Won't you enjoy the evening with me, Martina? Turner said, leaning forward and putting his hand on mine. A string of tingles sapped up my arm at his touch and my stomach did a cartwheel as I regretfully pulled my hand away and frowned at him. I'm here to discuss your offer to acquire a Keating and for no other reason. Have you had enough time to look over the menu? The server asked, appearing beside our table with a serious look that was amplified by her hair being pulled back into a very tight bun. I'd like the king salmon, please, Turner said. She turned to me. And for you? I, um. She'd like the chipino, Turner said, his tone confident before turning to me. Am I right? My mouth watered and I cursed my brother who had obviously filled Turner in on my favorite dish. Yes, that's fine. Very good, she said, adding a splash of champagne to each of our glasses and taking away our menus before disappearing. So, you've been talking with Adrian about me behind my back, I said, as I pulled out a legal pad and a pen, clicking the pen open loudly. Maybe a little, he said, lifting his flute and smiling at me in a way that made me wish this were a date. To our first business date. I sighed, lifting my flute. To our first business meeting. Our glasses clinked together and his smile was way too contagious because I found myself smiling back before I took a sip. You're very persistent. Yes, when I know what I want, he said, his gaze on mine. Turner's smile dazzled in the candlelight and the sunset light, making me wish he had been my actual blind date and not my greatest business competitor. Very fair, universe. Not. Let's just try to make the best of the evening, okay? He said, giving me a hopeful look. Yes, fine, I said, poising my pen over the yellow legal paid. Now, tell me what terms are you offering Ms. Keating? Were you an adventurous child? He asked, in response. I glanced up at him, which was a big mistake because his eyes looked dangerously sexy reflecting all those dancing lights. An adventurous child? What does that have to do with the acquisition? Do you have a favorite summer memory? I dropped my pen. I'm sorry? A favorite memory, he said, rolling his hand. Do you have a favorite memory of summer? You know, it's that season that comes after spring. It gets really hot. The days get longer, the nights more magical. I know what summer is, I said, letting out a sigh. Is that some sort of business school disarming technique? Do you ask all your competitors what their favorite summer memory is? No, of course not, he said, letting out a laugh. I would only ask my date, though it's been a while since I've had one to tell you the truth. He hadn't dated in a while. Interesting. I lifted an amused eyebrow. But this isn't a date. A business date, he said, challenging me with his gaze. Fine, whatever. The key word being business. He lifted his champagne glass in a cheers salute. The business of love. Look, I said, shoving my legal pad toward him and nearly knocking over the champagne glass he'd set back down. Oops. Just write down what terms you offered Ms. Keating and we can get out of here before the stars come out and make everything absolutely impossible. Being with me under the stars would make it impossible to resist me? Intriguing. 
He studied the legal pad in front of him. He tapped his finger on the yellow paper. If I write something on here then you have to promise to relax the rest of the evening, he said, lifting an eyebrow. Deal? Deal, I said, because I wasn't getting anywhere with him. I shook the hand he extended toward me, loving the feeling of his warm hand around mine. Plus, the bottle of champagne was here and I figured that would be enjoyable, so I could focus on that and not the hot man in front of me. Oh, so hot. I wouldn't be drinking with Turner, I told myself. I would simply be drinking in close proximity to him. Totally different. He scribbled notes on the legal pad and then moved it back across the table to me. Excuse me. I called as the server strode by. Would you please cancel our orders? Keep the orders, Turner said, assuring the server that I was kidding and shooing her away before I could assure him that I was most certainly not kidding. This is not Rothley's terms, I said, pointing out the obvious and tearing off the page from the legal pad. This is a list of the things you like about me. Not everything I like about you. Just the first things that came to mind. I sighed. Very inappropriate for a business meeting. Turner took a sip of champagne. But very appropriate for a date. This is not a, I gasped, noticing Adrian and Carrie moving arm in arm through the restaurant. In a sudden surge of panic, I grabbed Turner's wrist and urged him out of his chair and down beneath the table. Martina, what? Stay down, I whispered harshly. Hide. Hide. He gave me a mischievous look and went along good-naturedly, but when we were concealed as best as possible beneath the tablecloth he peeked out to see what the fuss was all about. This is great fun, but why are we, ah? Did you know he would be here? He shook his head. Although he did recommend the restaurant to me. Now you tell me this, I said, grabbing onto his arm and rolling my eyes. Has he seen us? Turner glanced at the grip I had on his arm and grinned in the dim light. It was the grin of childhood forts beneath blankets and chairs. Let me get this straight, he said, leaning toward me, so close I could feel his breath against my cheek. We're down here because you're afraid your little brother will see his best friend with his big sister? I huffed irritably. I don't want him to think it's a... My lips pressed together, but it was too late. Turner brushed his knuckles along my jawline and moved his cheek against mine to whisper in my ear. A date, perhaps? Yes, I said, resisting the fact that every cell in my body wanted me to kiss him right now. He paused, his face close to mine, studying me before he smiled as if knowing exactly what I was thinking. Because it's not a D-date, I reminded him. But the corners of his mouth curved upward as if he knew I wished that it were. Chapter 7 I was happy to go to the cat cafe with Tabitha for lunch on Saturday because it ticked several boxes at once from my operation relaxation checklist. Time with friends, cozy atmospheres, no screen time, warm, frothy beverages, and nature. Cats counted as nature, didn't they? Martina, I love you, you know I do, but you're going about this the wrong way, Tabitha said, as we entered the quaint, sunny cafe. You're not supposed to approach de-stressing like a business meeting. Think of it more like taking yourself out on a date. Oh, not this again. I cried, throwing my hands up. I learned immediately that cats don't like quick, unpredictable movements by humans, nor the high-pitched voice of a woman trying to convince herself nothing at all was going on with her rival and incredibly hot CEO. Nothing at all. I stood sheepishly as half a dozen cats scurried away with hisses and angry backward glares and hair prickled along their arched spines. I murmured several apologies to the patrons who had been enjoying the warmth of a cat on their lap and who now were, well, not. Oops. Martina, you have to relax, Tabitha said, dragging me to an empty window seat overlooking a leafy oak and padded with multicolored cushions and pillows. 
Cats can read your energy, you know? I'm relaxed, I said, even as I squeezed my briefcase tighter to my side and itched to glance at my phone. Very relaxed. We ordered two perfect chai lattes and by the time the drinks arrived, Tabitha had two gray kittens in her lap, a calico draped around her neck, a rag doll on his back playing with her shoelaces, and a little wiry black cat enjoying the sunshine and an ear scratch in the windowsill. All I had was a white cat staring at me with something like annoyance in his light-filled eyes. Hello, kitty, I said, as Tabitha ran her cheek along the little black cat's fur as he purred loudly. The white cat just swished his tail and gave me a look like my four-relaxed attitude wasn't fooling him. Tabitha, is that cat laughing at me? The Abyssinian, she said, shaking her head. No, cats don't. I glanced at her. What? She laughed and shook her head. It really does seem like he's laughing at you. I wrinkled my nose at him and decided to ignore him. He was pretty with those gray tiger stripes along his soft belly, but I had enough problems and simply would not take kindly to being laughed at by a cat. Martina, relax, Tabitha said, snuggling her black cat. I am, I said. If you hold the mug any tighter it's going to shatter, she said, making a face. Sorry, I said, checking if that cat was still watching me. He was, from over his shoulder. It's just this whole business thing with Turner. The guy you went on a date with at the Jeffreys Hotel? It wasn't a date, I said, forcing my voice to stay calm, a trick for regaining my cool. It didn't work. It was a business meeting. He's very cute. I won't argue there. I sighed, stirring the cinnamon atop my latte with a cute paw print stir stick. His eyes make my knees weak, his hair is tousled and sexy, he's charming and makes me laugh in. I was talking about the cat, Tabitha said, nodding toward my friend. Oh, I was too, I said, my cheeks heating as I glanced at the cat. Stop laughing. I think he likes you, she said with a frothed almond milk mustache. He won't get anywhere near me. She grinned. I was talking about Turner Easton. I wanted to throw a cat-shaped biscuit at her but I thought it best not to disturb the cats any further than my anxious energy had already done and because the biscuits were far too buttery and light and delicious to waste on Tabitha's neon pink, acid-washed overalls. Turner is another source of stress in my life, I said, but Tabitha did not look convinced. But I was grateful that she changed the subject, telling me about new items they were selling at Carrie's Kaleidoscope and how the Sacramento store had already become more profitable than the Blue Moon Bay store. City versus small town shoppers, I assumed. After lunch, I was startled and shocked when we finished our lattes and biscuits and Tabitha asked not just for the bill but for adoption papers for her little black windowsill cat. Tabitha, don't you think you need to think through this? I asked, incredulously. I mean, you haven't done any research at all. There's a cost analysis to conduct and, I don't know, aren't there like cat references or something you should check? Maybe run it by a vet? You're funny, Martina. Tabitha laughed and continued to nestle the black cat that was to be hers to her chest. It's a big decision, that's all I'm saying. What if you make a mistake? Oh, Martina, Tabitha said, with a sigh. Love is never a mistake. The server returned with a clipboard. You don't want to adopt two by any chance, do you? She asked, looking at the cat who seemed to be laughing at me. I'm afraid our Abyssinian will have to leave us tomorrow. Leave you? I asked, eyeing the cat who still sat watching me, his tail swishing in amusement. We can only keep the cats for so long, the server explained, a note of sadness in her voice. Tabitha scratched her chin. Well, I feel bad for him, but I don't know if I can take two. I. I'll take him, I blurted. Martina? Tabitha cried in surprise. I know. 
I know, I said waving my hands. But don't say anything or I'll start second-guessing my choice and end up making a real mistake with love by not leaving with that little guy. You love him? Tabitha asked. He makes my heart happy, I said, staring at the odd cat who really did lift my spirits for some unknown reason. Thank you so much, ma'am, the server said, hurrying off with a smile to get the adoption papers. I glanced toward the cat, my cat. Well, it's just going to be you and me, buddy. You're the first firm decision I've been able to make in months. Are you sure, Martina? Tabitha asked. Definitely not, I said, sneaking toward the cat as calmly as I could. But you said love is never a mistake. The cat just eyed me with that familiar glimmer in his eyes, tail swishing as if he knew what I just said and he was pleased. This is so exciting! Tabitha clapped her hands together. What are you going to name him? I don't know, I said, as I reached out for him. In the very moment that my fingertips brushed his soft fur, he darted away, laughing, like he just pulled the funniest joke. He's playing hard to get, Tabitha said. Can't blame him. It's because he's not sure what to expect, I said, hands on my hips as I watched his tail disappear around the corner. But I know exactly what I'm going to name him. Well? Tabitha asked. Don't keep me in suspense. I'm going to name him Turner. And twenty minutes later, I had Turner in a box with holes, and we were heading home. Chapter 8 I was hoping I wouldn't have to resort to this, but as it turned out adopting a cat was a major source of new stress in my life and things were getting dire. I had to do it. I just had to. There was no hope for me, no hope for the A. Keating acquisition, no hope for the future of the Maxwell House if I didn't do it, so I had no other choice but to do it. Yoga. I didn't fully understand how bending my body in ways it wasn't meant to bend, wriggling into pants my legs weren't meant to wriggle into, and balancing in ways gravity didn't mean for me to balance was going to help me de-stress. But Tabitha and Carrie both swore by yoga, so I signed up for a class, bought all the necessary gear, and promised myself a nice treat if I actually showed up and participated, a full hour of backlogged email tackling. As if the universe were playing a little joke on me, the little studio on the quiet, tree-lined street had a wall of mirrors so I could see how terrible I was at yoga ing. This was supposed to reduce my stress? Reflecting my failure in my face and forcing me to watch every wobble? With a deep breath, I watched the women around me unroll their mats and begin to stretch on them so I did the same. So far so good, I thought. Maybe yoga wouldn't be so hard after all. Class began with some guided breathing and I totally nailed it. I didn't know if the teacher gave out grades like my professors did at the university, but I was sure I at least earned a solid M- on my first try. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Oh, yeah, I was rocking it except for that exhale through your mouth thing. Why would I want to do that? By my second class I was sure I could have it down perfectly, though. No mistakes. Next, we were encouraged to get down on all fours on our mats and I managed that without error as well. We arched our backs up, down, up, down and my back bobbed at every arch. The cool breeze from the open windows felt nice, the soft music playing calmed me, and I mostly looked like all the other more experienced women in the mirror. Yay, me! The only downside was when the instructor called it the cat, cow pose, and I was triggered by the cat part specifically because this morning I stepped out of the shower and found the corners of my nice leather briefcase scratched by Turner. Breathe, Martina. In, out, exhale through the mouth, ugh, nose only please. I tried to follow the instructions for downward facing dog as best as I could, hips up, heels to the ground, chest pressing toward the floor. I was so focused, so determined not to mess up my de-stressing, that I barely heard the door to the studio crack open. 
then the pitter-patter of soft feet across the floor and the whispered apologies weaving between the mats, coming closer and closer until I heard another mat unrolling next to mine. On an exhale, I glanced over at the newcomer and saw Turner next to me, grinning from his upside-down position like mine. Good morning, Martina, Turner whispered. Maybe you can give me some pointers after class. What are you doing here? I whispered, as the rest of the class moved to their bellies with their heads up and their backs arched. Oops, I hurried to get into that position. You're messing me up, I said, giving him the evil eye. Messing up? He whispered, transitioning smoothly with the rest of the class as I remained stuck. Yoga is about what feels good to you, my love. My belly did a little dance at the term of endearment. Turner Easton was way too charming for his own good, or for my good anyway. My arms started to shake from my pose and the backs of my thighs burned. The breeze seemed to have stopped completely as sweat beaded down my spine. I couldn't hear the soothing music anymore due to my ragged breathing. And I was now terribly lost on what to do with my body, which was now tense, tight, and filled with stress. You didn't tell me why you're here, I said, glancing over at him under my quivering arm. He rose up into the split-legged stance, arms held out, and I could do nothing but watch. He looked down at me with a wink. All this acquisition stuff has been stressful. I need to decompress, he said, moving so smoothly through the positions. You want a hand? No. I feel great here, I lied. So, Turner Easton did yoga regularly, if his seamless poses were any indication. He also thought he had a keying in the bag. So unfair, I thought a sweat dripped into my eyes. Well, a, Keating would be mine if I had anything to say about it. Following the yoga instructor's guidance, Turner swept his chest low toward the mat, arched his back in a way that I was sure would snap mine in two, and then raised his hips so he was back in position with me in downward-facing dog. Still feel great, he asked, his tousled hair somehow falling in a sexy way around his eyes while I had to huff and puff mine out of my vision to see. Couldn't be more relaxed, I lied holding my breath. Wait, breathe in, and out. Better. The truth was I had no clue how to win over Alexandra Keating by fitting in with her, Turner the cat had chewed through my leather, and right now I was very close to falling onto my face. In this moment, I could not have been any less relaxed. Turner chuckled as he twisted his leg under him, stretched an arm toward the ceiling, opened his chest toward me, and wiggled his toes against mine. You don't look relaxed, sweetie. Well, I am, pumpkin. I would have swatted him away, but any sudden movements might result in an ER visit, a broken nose, and a swift cancellation of goat yoga with Tabitha on Sunday. Would you mind terribly moving somewhere else? You're disturbing my zen. Turner continued with whatever pose he and the rest of the class had been doing and then he dropped his head back over his shoulder to spy on me in my predicament. I wouldn't mind moving at all, he said, his eyes practically glittering so I knew what was coming was bad news. Just agree to a date with me. A real date this time. No, thanks, I said, finding myself holding my breath again. When had breathing become so difficult? Oh, right, from being next to the man I wanted to date but couldn't. Turner flipped over and transitioned into a bridge with extended arms. He smiled up at me upside down. Your arms are shaking, sweetie. They will be sore on our date. I am not going on a date with you. Are you trying to tilt to the side like that? No way, no way. Be careful. Seems like you're about to. With a yelp, I toppled over and laid in a flustered, sweaty heap on the mat. Fall, Turner concluded with a grimace. You okay? Fine. I pushed my hair from my face and glared at him. Very relaxed. You're done, aren't you? I crossed my arms over my chest. I don't care what anyone says. 
Yoga is stressful. Turner started rising to his feet, arms spreading wide above his head, before he glanced down at me. I'll take you on a date to make you feel better. How will that make me feel better? It will be a real date. He smiled, murmured namaste with the rest of the class, and then rolled up his yoga mat. Pick you up at seven, sweetie. Okay, I said, flopping back on my mat, with no energy left to resist him. Chapter 9 Don't worry, this date is going to be relaxing. Turner held the door to the luxury spa open for me and I paused in the doorway to look up at him, his blue-eyed gaze on mine. Well, I'm all for relaxing, I said, feeling fairly sure I wasn't being led into a room where he would tie me up until he signed all the necessary papers with Alexandra. At least the spa looked legit with its trickling fountains, vine-covered walls, and delicate aroma of lemon and lavender. Though I wouldn't put anything past the CEO of Rothleys when it came to winning an acquisition as major as a Keating. You asked for a relaxing date, so that's what you're getting, he said, his hand on the small of my back as he guided us toward the front desk decorated with slate gray river stones. What's more relaxing than a couple's massage? Dual massage, I corrected, lifting a finger and wiggling it back and forth. Let's just call it a dual massage, all right? I don't think that's quite right, he said, shaking his head. How about soulmate's massage? Turner. Sweetie. Don't make me ask for separate rooms, I said, smirking over at him. Because I really do need to relax and I will ask for separate rooms. All right, you've made your point, he said, as we stopped in front of the desk and a woman turned from her computer to smile at us. Turner slapped his palm down on the counter and announced grandly, we're a match made in heaven, soulmates, definitely going to get married and die old together, and need a couple's massage please. The woman at the desk giggled as if she thought he was adorable. We're actually business associates, I said, which seemed to perk the woman up a bit. If you could change the reservation, I'd like my massage as far away from him as possible. Ignore her, Turner said rubbing the small of my back. She's so in love with me she can't think straight. I'll just need your name, she said, looking disappointed, but professional as she pulled the keyboard in front of her, fingers at the ready. Casanova, Turner said, winking down at me as I groaned. His name is Turner, I said, in order to save the receptionist from unnecessary typing. Turner Easton. This had better end up being a great massage because my blood pressure was already rising. I noticed the flicker of a frown on the receptionist's face even before she turned to us and said, I'm not seeing anything under that name. Should I check under a different name? What was it again? Casanova, Turner said, beaming from ear to ear. Casanova what? Turner thought about it. Casanova Casanova. I suppose. Well, still nothing, the receptionist said. Could the reservation be under any other name? Perhaps your girlfriend's name? Oh, I am not his girlfriend, I said, just as Turner said, oh, I didn't make a reservation. We both turned to each other at the same time and both said, what? I tilted my head, my dark hair falling across my cheek. You didn't make a reservation? You're not my girlfriend? But this is already our second date. This spontaneous side of you is not as adorable as you think, I lied, squeezing his cheeks in my hand before I leaned toward the receptionist. Really, he must have made a reservation. She shook her head. Sorry, there's no reservation and we're completely booked. I turned to him. But, surely, he would have known how stressful it would be to arrive here only to find out that there were no openings available, especially given that the main criteria of the state was that it be relaxing. The receptionist winced as she glanced up at Turner. We typically suggest our clients call us at least a month in advance. I let my forehead fall to the counter and I groaned loudly. As soon as I felt a warm arm slip around my waist, 
I pulled myself together, thanked the receptionist, and walked straight out of the spa. I heard Turner come out the door and he was at my side in a few quick strides. Sorry about the spa, sweetie, he said, thumbing over his shoulder. Who knew you had to make reservations? I turned to face him. Everyone knows that, Turner. Now where's the bus? Turner hurried to catch up with me as I began weaving between cars. The normally empty lot just outside of the city seemed to be packed due to a small fair going on and it made getting my bearings difficult. The bus? Turner asked, jumping in front of me. What are we going to do that's relaxing on a bus? We are not going to do anything, I said, putting a hand to my chest. I'm going to take the bus back to work. Turner gave me a puppy dog look. But our date was supposed to be relaxing, I said, before dodging around him. Wait a minute, he said, jumping in front of my path. His eyes were shining at something just over my shoulder. I have an idea of something that's way more relaxing than a couple's massage. For real? I turned around, scanning the packed parking lot for this elusive source of calm and serenity. Turner gestured toward the fair. The Ferris wheel? I asked, watching the bucket seats sway gently in the heat of the late afternoon. He came up beside me, slipping his hand around mine. No. More relaxing than a couple's massage, hmm, I studied the fair, which looked bustling and busy. A basket weaving booth? No, try again, he said. My eyebrows came together and I stared at the busy fair, but then, oh, no. I immediately began shaking my head when I saw it. No way, I said, trying to back up. Turner's broad chest stopped me as his grin widened. Yes. That would so not be relaxing, Turner. Come on, he said, laughing and leading me in the direction of the fair and what I totally did not want to do. Yikes! Surprise, surprise, a couple's go-kart race is way more stressful than a couple's massage. Not that Turner's excited expression was any indication that he might possibly agree. The man looked like a kid at Disneyland. My shoulders tensed before getting into the lime green cart speckled with multicolor sparkles and Turner and I had our first major debate over who should get to drive. It quickly devolved into a conversation like this. Well, I'm a CEO so I should drive, I said. Well, I'm a CEO so I should drive, he said. Well, I was a CEO first, so there. Give me the date you started the position. In your dreams, Turner. You know it's bad when the children gathered around the starting line, who were buckling on their helmets, started to stare and whisper, since when do they let babies in here? We settled the matter like any two reasonable, sensible, fair adults, we did rock, paper, scissors. I, of course, won. Turner made his displeasure well known as the race began, or at least began for the nine other pairs in the go-karts of varying shades of blue and orange and yellow. Um, did you forget which pedal is the gas? Turner asked, as go-karts zipped away from us amongst the sound of revved engines and gleefully laughing kids. I'm making sure the coast is clear first, I said, adjusting the dinky little side mirror which was hard to see in due to the gunk and wads of decades-old gum. I don't care who won rock, paper, scissors. I'm going to use my gas if you don't get moving. We're totally left in the dust. I took a deep breath. Now we can go. If this were a professional race, then we would have lost by now Miss CEO, he said, slipping an arm around me. Good thing it's not a professional race, I said, pulling out slowly from the now empty starting line and easing gently around the first rubber tire line bend, keeping my front wheels perfectly in the middle of the race track. We're here to relax and have fun. Turner faced me. Um, Polly, love? Don't call me Polly. Okay, Polaris, love? Don't call me that either. 
Sweet darling, apple of my eye? You're distracting me, I said, applying the brakes at a particularly tight curve. Shoo. I'm trying to relax and you're making it difficult. Can I just ask one quick question? I pushed the visor of the helmet up to see better and checked my side mirrors. Fine, one question. He nodded. Um, what? I glanced over at him only when it was perfectly safe to do so. What do you mean by what? He gestured to the steering wheel. I mean, what are you doing? Driving a go-kart, I said, twisting the steering wheel with steady, firm motions. It's a go-kart, so it's supposed to go forward, get it? He said, gesturing to the gas pedal. Can you maybe drive a little faster? I shook my head. No, I cannot. Turner slumped in his seat as the manager of the go-kart area caught up to us with a fast stride and spit out a sunflower shell that stuck to the driver's side mirror. Ick. Everything all right here? He asked, easily keeping pace with us. I smiled up at him. Just fine. Thanks. The car goes faster, you know, he said, popping a handful of seeds into his mouth. Thank you, I said, feeling annoyed that the guy was taking Turner's side. But we're trying to relax so we're fine. He shrugged. Alrighty then. Have a nice day, I said, smiling as he watched us carefully and responsibly move away. Oh, come on, Martina, Turner said, as the first of the other racers lapped us in a rush of wind that blew some of my hair in my eyes. We're getting embarrassed out here. I'm not embarrassed, I said, smiling over at him. Perhaps you should learn to relax. One by one the go-cards flashed by, bouncing wildly into one another, ricocheting dangerously off the tire boundaries. Do you see that? I shouted to Turner over the roar of the engines. They're messing up and hitting things. That's got to jerk your body around. I'd be at my chiropractor for a month if I drove like them. Messing up, he said, pointing to the gas pedal. Messing up is the fun of go-karts, sweetie. Let's go faster. I will not be pressured. I glanced over at him, momentarily taking my eyes off the road. No, I wasn't proud of that fact, okay? What? he asked. You keep calling me sweetie, I said. It's how I think of you, he said pulling his arm away and looking slightly startled in a way I'd never seen before. He was always cool, casual, charming, and totally at ease. But there was an uncertain flicker in his eyes as if he were unsure. That's sweet, I said, throwing him a bone. I'm glad you think so, he said, slipping his arm back around my shoulders and playing with the bow tie on the sleeve of my shirt. You're going to crash. I ripped my eyes away from his, ready in an instant to wrench the steering wheel to avoid a collision as a lone plastic bag wafted across the track. Since I was coasting safely along the center of the track, I merely swerved to the right a little and was no more in danger of hitting the tires than I had been at the very start when we were sitting still. I shot him a look. How was that going to make me crash? He shrugged his shoulders innocently. I thought you'd want to be aware of the danger that lurked at your high speed. You're being a little overly cautious, don't you think? The point of this state was relaxation, I said, as we were lapped again by the kids. If I go slow then I won't make a mistake, and not making a mistake means no stress. I'm glad you're calling this a date, he said, his fingers moving back and forth against the skin beneath my sleeve and sending tingles up my neck. With his other hand, he walked his fingers along the asphalt beside our go-kart. But if you go any slower then I'm pretty sure ants will pass us. Safety first, I said, grinning at him. That's my motto. Maybe if you learn that hitting the railings isn't a mistake we can go faster, he said, wearing an excited expression as he grinned. 
Hitting the railings is a chance to course correct, which is an opportunity to better prepare for the next bend, and is like a seminar on handling adversity and... It's a mistake, I said, shaking my head curtly. Nice pitch, but we will not be making a mistake on my watch. The race didn't end when our stress-free driven go-kart crossed the finish line, but when the manager and his bag of sunflower seeds walked up beside us and told us that the other go-karts had completed their laps and he didn't have all day so where we were in the race would have to be good enough. Whatever, dude. Well, that was fun, I said, putting my hand in Turner's as he helped me out of the go-kart. Was it? He asked. Yes, I said, even though concentrating on staying directly in the center of the track had made my shoulders ache. But I always had a good time whenever I was around Turner whether I wanted to or not. Thanks for picking rock over paper. Better luck next time. As I turned to leave the go-kart starting area, Turner caught me by the hand and spun me around as if I were a graceful dancer. Not so fast, sweetie, he said. What? I asked, wondering if he was going to finally make a move and kiss me. If so, I wasn't going to resist, even though I totally should, but those eyes seemed to peer right through me, so no I would definitely not resist. My heart rate kicked up and I held my breath as he smiled. It's my turn to drive, he said, tugging my hand and leading back to the go-kart line. I let out my breath. No kiss, which was probably for the best. You're not going to drive slowly, are you? I asked. He shook his head. We did it your way, and now we're going to do it mine. The carnival lights flashed in his blue eyes and I felt a smile spread across my face. Something about the look in his eyes excited me, or maybe it was just being around him. Either way, I was ready to take a ride with Turner at the wheel, ready to see where it would lead. Once Turner got behind the wheel of the go-kart, it all happened so fast. The manager spit out a mouthful of seeds, EW, the light flashed green, the go-kart rocketed forward, the wind whipped my hair back, the go-kart bounced against the tires at the curve and then bounced against a wide-eyed competitor's go-kart, and we zipped around the track again and again until the checkered flag waved. Turner skidded the go-kart to a halt, jumped out of the go-kart at the same time I did, and we threw our arms around each other. Then, he picked me up, twirled me around as I squeezed him close enough to smell his shampoo, tight enough to feel his heart beating against mine, and my huge, unstoppable smile brushed against the warmth of his neck. Like I said, it all happened so fast. The whirlwind of events that had lasted only five minutes suddenly crashed over me like a wave I hadn't seen coming. When Turner lowered me to the ground, I stepped away with my hand at the back of my neck and my cheeks hot from something that felt like wind chap. My legs were wobbly and my heart thrashed around in my chest like my ribs were race tracks lined with rubber. Stay right here, Turner said, setting a hand on my shoulder briefly, a casual move that sent delicious sparks across my skin. When he returned, I was still trying to catch my breath and, more importantly, my self-control. I lifted my head to find Turner grinning at me, holding up a little plastic trophy. My reflection flashed in that fogel trophy and I jumped back in horror. I need a brush, I blurted, throwing my hands over my wild hair. A brush would be good. A brush would be something I could control. A brush would be steady and slow and my world didn't spin and twirl and rush with a brush. Martina, you're fine, Turner said pulling me close to him and brushing a piece of hair back behind my ear. I look like a mess, I said, laughing nervously. You look beautiful, he said, his blue eyes fixed on mine. My hair is out of control, I said, waving a hand at the frizzy, poofy mess. I look like I just got out of bed. You look like you just won a race, he said, lacing his fingers through mine and tugging me toward the other drivers who were climbing out of their go-karts. Now, let's go take our trophy and rub it into those kids' faces. He had been joking, apparently, because he merely led me to the little frozen ice cream stand. Vanilla for me, wild berry for Turner, go figure. 
We climbed up to the top of the little set of bleachers, I proposed the bottom step, but since he won he got to choose, and admired our little plastic trophy that sat between us as we licked our cones while watching fresh go-karts whip around the course. My heartbeat slowed until it rested at a calm, steady pace. The sun was starting to set behind the less filled parking lot and the colors painted across the sky rivaled the bright, flashing neon bulbs on the ferris wheel, the glittering booth for the ring toss, and the swings were tan, bare legs kicked and soared. Well, he said, after a long stretch of silence between us. I turned to find a dab of ice cream above his upper lip, his crumpled napkin in his hand, whereas I kept mine folded and pristine to dab as needed against the corners of my mouth. This time, I used it on Turner, though. Well, what? I asked, after his face was all clean again. Are you going to admit that this was a very relaxing second date, he asked. You have an interesting idea of relaxation. I laughed. You took me to a day spa where you didn't have a reservation and then you stumbled into a plan B only because of dumb luck. You dragged me into a deadly vehicle and whipped me around so fast that it'll probably be weeks before I get all the knots out of my hair. He grinned at me in the twilight. And? I eyed him a moment. And I feel relaxed. It's about time, he said, nudging his arm against mine. It really is, I said, returning my attention to the ice cream cone. Turner didn't press any further. Instead, he leaned back to rest his elbows on the railing. He slowly stretched out one long leg and then the other. Then he did give a long, drawn-out, contented sigh. We said nothing more but I continued to smile as I finished the rest of my ice cream cone, not wanting to let a single drop fall. We had a fun time even after the disaster of the couple's massage, the disastrous rush of the go-karts, but they were disasters I wouldn't forget for a long time to come. A memorable disaster. A sweet disaster. A funny, exciting, blood-pumping disaster. A kind of, sort of stress-relieving disaster, thanks to Turner insisting on a second date. Chapter 10 I met Turner late the following afternoon, but this time it wasn't for a date. It was for war. My best heels made sharp, determined claps against the concrete as I marched toward where he leaned casually against a lamp post. I gripped my scratched-up briefcase, which I'd attempted to fix and sort of improved with a black marker, at my side, adjusted my press suit jacket, and lowered my sunglasses to my turner as I came to a stop in front of him just outside of Alexandra Keating's boutique art auction house in downtown Sacramento. I hope you're ready, I said, raising an eyebrow. I spent all night preparing the Maxwell House's pitch. He smiled, holding his coffee cup suspended halfway to his full mouth. Pitch? I thought Alexandra said she wanted to meet with us to chat. My laugh was deep and throaty. Chat doesn't really mean chat, Turner. You think she invited us here to discuss the weather? Maybe not just weather, he said, the corner of his lips curling upward as he sipped his coffee and shrugged. He eyed me as I double-checked that I had all my prepared documents and files and, if necessary, jump drives for PowerPoint presentations. Maybe our taste in art? I rolled my eyes. Right. Maybe what connects us as human beings? I snorted. Uh-huh. Maybe love. Okay, Turner, I said, straightening the silk square in the pocket of his suit. Good luck with that discussion. Maybe you can fill her in on go-kart racing while you're at it. Just then Alexandra poked her head out the door of her boutique. She wore cat-eye style glasses today printed with tiny cat silhouettes in a rainbow of different colors. She had on her typical black turtleneck despite the warm temperature outside. Ready, Martina and Turner? she asked. I glanced over my shoulder at Turner with a victorious smile before turning to her. I'm ready, I said, as I followed her inside, wondering if it was a sign that she'd said my name first. It had to be a sign. Well, hopefully. 
I was slightly surprised when Alexandra didn't lead us to her office, but instead to two low, stylish couches in the intimate back gallery. There was nothing back here but a small side table made from a piece of petrified wood with tea set for three and a woven rug. There wasn't really anywhere to spread out my papers and certainly no computer or projector for my just-in-case PowerPoint presentation. Please make yourselves comfortable, Alexandra said, sinking onto one of the couches and spreading her thin arms wide across the back. Those weren't the words I had been expecting to hear, more like, who would like to go first, or my assistant will be bringing the computer and projector in just a moment or let the bidding war begin. But I could totally be flexible and relaxed about this. I was less enthused about how she gestured for me to sit next to Turner on the opposing couch. I wouldn't be able to focus with him that close to me. The scent of him would take my mind to the night before, to the rush of the go-karts, to his arm around me, and to his smile in the colorful, dancing lights. I needed to be here, in the present moment, if I was going to win over Alexandra Keating. Alexandra. I had the place on the couch next to Turner where I was supposed to sit. Perhaps I can give my pitch for the Maxwell House standing up? She looked up at me over the top of her glasses. Pitch, she said, her forehead wrinkling. Martina, I thought I explained on the phone that this was just going to be a chat. Well, I... I do hope you didn't prepare anything formal for this get-together, she said leaning forward slightly. I really just want to have a conversation with you both. I felt the weight of all the papers in my briefcase that I'd slaved over last night as I shook my head and swallowed heavily. Oh, I said, almost able to hear an I told you so from Turner. Yes, of course. Well, then, she said, gesturing toward the couch with her palms pressed together. I set my briefcase down as gently as possible so no one would hear the bricks of work inside and sat as close to the arm of the couch as I could without literally being on top of it. I didn't even dare a glance over at Turner. Alexandra, he said, setting his ankle on his opposite knee and lifting a teacup. Did you know about the little carnival fair taking place just south of the city? My eyebrows knitted together in a momentary frown. This was a mistake. It wasn't a professional subject to discuss with a well-respected figure in the art community who was looking to sell her auction house. This was idle chit-chat. Really? Alexandra's head tilted to the side, her eyes widening with interest. Yes, he said, lifting his teacup in my direction. Martina told me about it. He turned to look at me and this only confused me more. Was he helping me out of the hole I dug for myself? Why would he do that? We were business competitors after all. Um, yes, I said, feeling scared of saying the wrong thing. To be honest, I didn't really know what I was expected to say. I told him because. You were struck by how beautiful the light is at sunset, he said, taking a relaxed sip of tea. Isn't that what you said? My eyes darted between Turner who was looking at me earnestly and Miss Keating who was looking at me expectantly. Um, I did say something to that effect. Alexandra nodded, as if in understanding. It's important for an artist to recognize beautiful light. Some might argue that there is nothing more to art than light. Turner nodded and then I nodded so I wouldn't be left out. None of this had anything to do with a return on investment or buyout packages or marketing schemes. I was out of my depth and somehow Turner was my water flotation device. I fell in love with a woman at a fair once, Turner said, making me choke on my tea. It was probably a whole lot like the romantic date you were telling me about, Martina. Turner kept his face professional as he turned to me, but his eyes were anything but, dancing with amusement. I saw in them that enthusiastic smile, that broad, wide, contagious smile. I ducked my eyes to keep from blushing. We talked about romance and light and art for about an hour. By the end of the conversation, I could see why Alexandra told me she was leaning toward Rothlis. 
Turner was passionate about art and he expressed that passion in such a lively, charming manner. I could see why she liked him. I could see why a lot of people could like him. I could definitely see why I liked him. But what about business? I didn't want to blow this purchase for my dad. After the conversation with Alexandra, Turner and I stepped onto the sidewalk together and he grabbed my hand as I turned to leave. I still had a lot of work to catch up on and a cat to pick up from Tabitha's pro bono kitty daycare. Take a walk with me, he said, his thumb brushing against my wrist. I don't know, I bit my bottom lip, feeling very tempted but torn. I have a million and a half things to do in. You're still doing that relaxation thing, aren't you? I hesitated. Well, yeah. Good, he said, gently leading me with him as he clasped his hand around mine. There's nothing more relaxing than a late afternoon walk. Although a little voice inside my head said it wasn't a good idea, I gave in to temptation and those beautiful blue eyes and decided to take a late afternoon stroll with Turner. You said there's nothing more relaxing than a late afternoon walk, I said, knowing I had only myself to blame for my current predicament. But it's my fault because I knew better. We were lost. I was the farthest thing from relaxed. Half the contents of my briefcase lay littered on the asphalt of a narrow alleyway bathed in the yellow glare of a street lamp as I struggled to find my cell phone amongst all the pre-meeting prep. Turner was trying to sweep up all the papers and notebooks and pens and USB drives and paper clips and highlighters and laser pointers that fell to the ground, but I was going at such a frantic pace that it was hard for him to keep up. This was a mistake, I said, as my fingers brushed the very bottom of my briefcase. A huge mistake. You dropped your briefcase. It's no big deal, Turner said, his voice calm. The little walk I'd agreed to take with Turner had quickly become a let's go a bit further and then a well, maybe just to the next corner and then a let's check out those lovely rose bushes up the block and before I knew it, I'd lost track of everything but Turner, his smile and the sound of his voice amongst the chirping birds and rustling leaves. A walk became a talk and the talk became a doorway into a world where there was only Turner and me and the coming twilight like a curtain dropping around us. Maybe if we hadn't stopped because of that red signal, we would have continued walking and talking all the way to Lake Tahoe. But the LED hand flashed across the lamp-lit street and it was like a hypnotist had snapped his fingers. All of a sudden, I craned my neck in the growing darkness to squint at the crooked street signs. I didn't recognize either of them. We crossed the street and I looked down the long, tree-lined road that narrowed in each direction to pinpoints in the dark. Where are we? I asked. The blinking red hand hadn't snapped Turner out of his reverie the way it had for me, because he glanced around and then shrugged. Don't know. Should we head right or left? What time is it? I asked, stopping at the corner. Turner went a few more steps before seeming to realize I wasn't with him and then he backtracked. What did you say? What time is it? I said, feeling the tension rise in my shoulders. Where are we? How long have we been walking? Can we call a car service from out here? What if I've missed calls from the office? What if I've missed calls from Alexandra? He chuckled. You want me to answer all those questions or just pick my favorite? That's when I'd started rummaging through my briefcase for my cell phone, which would tell me what time it was and where we were. It would tell me how to get back to the office, to work, to what I was supposed to be doing. Where is my cell phone? I asked when I'd emptied the entire contents of my briefcase and found nothing more but leather lining beneath my fingertips. With an armful of my papers, he looked up at me, a grin forming on his lips. Have you checked your pocket? Of course, I've checked my pockets. I threw my hands up, wishing I could live every day as relaxed as him. I wondered if his dad thought he did a good job. I'd bet he'd never disappointed anyone in his life. 
Do you really think I pulled everything out of my briefcase without first checking the most obvious spot for a cell, oh? Find it? My cheeks heated when I felt the outline of my phone against my front pocket. Yes, it's in my pocket, I admitted in a quiet voice. Good thing you checked there first, he said, holding back laughter, perhaps from a sense of his own well-being given my frazzled state. With a sigh of relief, I pulled out my cell phone and checked the time, way too late, before my screen went black. What? No, not possible. But, yes. I had neglected to charge my phone earlier and now the battery was dead. No, no, no. I said, shaking the phone as if I could will it to power back on. I turned to Turner, who was scratching his neck. Please, tell me you brought your phone and didn't leave it at the office because you're all about being present in the moment. I could tell you, but it would be a lie, he said, reaching for my hand. We can head back if you have things to do. Don't worry. Worry? I'd never get anything done if I didn't worry. I let out a wail of despair before I started walking down the street in the opposite direction and keeping an eye out for a cab that may have been lost in this quiet, unfamiliar neighborhood. Otherwise, I knew I'd be walking for hours. Maybe in the right direction. Maybe not. All the work I wasn't going to get done that night flashed through my head like a train charging at me, faster and faster, with its horn finally blaring. This was a mistake, I said, as he ran up beside me, carrying my briefcase. I tried to take it from him but he wouldn't let me. All I do is make mistakes. Martina, Turner reached for my hand but I pulled it away. He'd realize soon enough that I wasn't the organized put-together woman he thought he knew. What would he think about me then? Would he think of the word sweetie or would he think of the word failure? Maybe someone will be in their front yard and... Martina! I stopped to find Turner half a block behind me. Holding my heavy briefcase with one hand he nodded toward a narrow sidewalk crowded with fragrant rose bushes and a house from which warm yellow light spilled out like bits of confetti to the ground. Did you even see this place? He called back to me. I moved toward him and the sounds of guitar strings being plucked, murmured conversation, and the clinking of glasses. What is it? I asked. The Rose House, he said, when I made it back to where he stood outside an ornate iron gateway that led to a tiny restaurant with no more than a handful of intimate tables that could be seen through the large windows. It looked like a little rare gem hidden amongst cheap plastic pearls. And I hadn't seen it. In fact, I would have walked right past it in my panic and it would have been lost to me forever like a message in a bottle I didn't bother to open. They probably have a charger and an outlet for your phone, he said, slipping his arm around me in a comforting way. I chewed at my lip for a moment and then lifted my lashes. And wine, maybe? Chapter 11 Given that I was currently challenged in the decision department, I needed to avoid places with an abundance of choices. Therefore, it obviously overwhelmed me when Turner and I learned that the restaurant we'd stumbled upon was a Spanish tapas place. Although I wasn't sure how, Turner seemed to understand my issues and only gave me as long as it took the server to come over to our table to deliberate over the menu, even though I'd considered making spreadsheets on my cell, which was currently charging beside me, and I'd actually started writing a pros and cons list on a cocktail napkin. So, when the server asked if we had any questions and I opened my mouth to answer her, Turner placed his hand flat across my menu and said, we'll have one of everything. And wine. Your finest wine. Is that all right? He asked, turning to me. Yes, I said, since he'd ordered everything and there wasn't the possibility of mistakenly ordering the wrong tapas. Just to confirm, one of everything on the menu? the server asked. That would be great, Turner said. The server started to walk away before coming back and giving us a questioning look. We're sure, Turner said. Okay, then, she said, and glanced back at us with a quizzically raised eyebrow before disappearing into the bustling kitchen. 
Can't go wrong this way, can we? Turner said, leaning back in his chair. I can't believe you ordered everything on the menu, I said, with a smile. Nothing is too much when it comes to my future wife, he said. My belly did a little dance. You're going to have to stop saying things like that. Why? Because I'm going to believe you mean that, I said. I do mean it, he said, as the server returned with a bottle of Tempranillo. Let me know if you approve, Turner said, fixing his gaze on me. You want me to decide? I asked, wondering how I found this thoughtful guy. Finally, my clumsiness and chaos had paid off. Wait, did I really mean that? As I watched the server pour a splash of the red liquid into my glass, I decided I did mean that I was happy Turner had come into my life. Very happy. When had Turner worked his way into my feelings? I lifted my glass and took a sip, deciding right away I loved it. Delicious, thank you. She nodded, filling the rest of my glass and then filling Turner's glass before setting the bottle on the table and zipping away. To an easy decision for me due to your ordering the best wine, I said, holding up my glass. And to our third date, he said, clinking his glass to mine before taking a sip. After easy conversation over our first glass of wine, we had to have two mosaic tables pulled up next to ours to hold the dishes that extended to the window ledge next to us. The tiny blue glazed plates were placed between glasses of the red tempranillo and candles thick with trails of wax, and included breaded curlicues of calamari, bacon-wrapped dates, and little dishes of olives, each shinier and more alluring than the previous. The aroma from our feast filled the tiny restaurant, which was decorated with beautiful, colorful tiles likely imported from artisans in Spain. The wine and the rich food and the crackle of a small wood-burning fire warmed us as a guitarist played in the corner, one song mournfully, the next upbeat, all plucking at my heartstrings. Turner's lips looked moist from the wine, my fingers were sticky with a balsamic glaze, and my cheeks were hot from the candle flames since I kept leaning toward Turner to hear the latest words he'd said to make me laugh. I bit into a mouth-watering ham croquette and sighed. All right, I said. Turner swirled his wine around his glass, brought it to his nose and inhaled. All right? What does that mean? he asked. The walk was a good mistake, I said, as I dabbed the napkin against my lips. Isn't that an oxymoron? Turner said, faux gasping and clutching his chest. What's gotten into you? Do I need to take away your wine? Don't you dare, I said laughing as he reached for my glass. I'm glad you're relaxed, he said, popping a bite of chorizo into his mouth. I sampled a tortilla espanola and then lifted my lashes. I really don't know how you do it. How I do what? I lifted a shoulder. How you don't get stressed from work, in your drive to succeed and prove yourself. He sipped his wine, studying me. Who would I need to prove myself to? I don't know. Your parents? They wanted me to take over their dental practice. I went in a different direction, he said, with a smirk. Were they upset with you? I asked. Strangely, yes, he said, looking uncharacteristically serious for a moment. I didn't understand why they wouldn't support my choice. There were many arguments. Some threats on their part to not pay for college and threats on my part to not go to college. I leaned toward him, enthralled by his story. Did you feel bad disappointing them? Yes, he said, taking a sip of wine and then playing with the stem. But I would feel worse living a life I don't want to live. I leaned over and took his hand. You're very strong. You are too, he said. Not the way you are, I said, the backs of my eyes burning. I'm terrified of letting my dad down. He built the Maxwell house from the bottom up and only retired when I took over the reins. I wanted to be the CEO so badly, but now that I am I'm afraid I'll blow it. 
He squeezed my hand. You won't. You don't ever feel like that? I asked, almost begging him to relate so that I wouldn't feel quite so insane. I focus on what I want to happen, not what could go wrong, he said, his thumb caressing my palm and sending tingles skittering across my skin. Everyone makes mistakes. To try to never make one is insanity. I bit my bottom lip. That's how I feel now. Stressed to the point of crazy. Except when I'm with you. The corner of his mouth lifted. I'm glad. You're glad I fell into your arms? I asked, feeling my heart flutter with anticipation. He nodded. Best moment of my life. And a nice catch, I said, smiling. Martina, he paused, clearing his throat, as if searching for the right words. Do you think your dad wants you to feel that way? Stressed and so afraid to make a misstep that you're paralyzed in making decisions? Well, no, I said, the question taking me by surprise. My father loves me and wants me to be happy. Can I tell you something? Turner asked. I laughed. Since when do you ask permission for anything? He inclined his head, though his smile didn't quite reach his eyes this time. The guitar music seemed to fade away as did the other dinner guests and the noise from the kitchen. After a silent moment of just his eyes holding mine, I nodded. With his hand entwined with mine, he said, I used to be like you in a lot of ways, a workaholic, really committed, desperate to succeed and prove I'd made the right choice. That kind of pressure felt familiar to me. But one day I realized they were never going to agree and I stopped trying to prove myself and started enjoying my job. The stress faded away and I enjoyed each day until you know what happened? I shook my head. We were celebrating my 30th birthday and my dad said he'd never seen me so happy and that he was proud I picked my own path. My eyes watered. He said that? Yes. Turner sipped his wine and smiled as he rubbed his thumb in soothing circles around my hand. Ironic, isn't it? I just don't want to let him down, I said, biting my bottom lip. But I guess you're saying I shouldn't worry about that. I'm saying to enjoy your life, which is yours to live the way you want. He released my hand and I stared at the empty place where his fingers had laid against mine. My whole life has been about work, I admitted softly. To think about enjoying life for the sake of enjoying it? I wouldn't know where to start. The current moment is always a good place to start, he said, the corners of his mouth curving upward. I smiled, too. We remained silent for a long time as the guitarist played and the candles burned and the wine painted our lips beautiful shades of berry. Finally, Turner glanced at my cell phone, which was fully charging beside a plate of mussels. Maybe it's getting late, he asked. It is, I said, staring at the little blinking light which meant a new email, a new message, a new to-do item. But that's okay. I'm enjoying the moment. He smiled, his gaze holding mine, as we enjoyed the rest of the evening until we were informed the restaurant was closed. Chapter 12 The next morning, I offered to treat Tabitha to coffee since she had been babysitting Turner, the cat, for me because I didn't return from dinner with Turner, the man, until late. She and I decided to meet at Courtney Carmichael's coffee cart before I picked my cat up since she had amazing coffee drinks, was one of the sweetest people on the planet, and had fun island music. As we approached the coffee cart, Atticus, Courtney's sweet little poodle mix, bounded over to us as we waved to Courtney who was finishing a drink for a customer. The cute little dog ran between our legs, his tiny pink tongue hanging from the side of his mouth as he panted. I swept him into my arms as we ducked beneath the big straw umbrella that kept the bright morning sun off the coffee cart. Atticus got to come to work today, huh? I asked, scratching the puppy behind the ear as he squirmed around to try and lick my face. It's been a while. Courtney laughed as she started making our drinks. 
Tabitha and I visited Courtney so often that she didn't need to ask our orders at this point. She judged how many shots of espresso to use in my drink by how tired I looked and how much whipped cream to use by my mood. She never seemed to be wrong. Atticus has been here the last few times you've stopped by, Martina, Courtney said, with a knowing smile. You've just been too stressed to notice. All caught up in your phone and muttering, but today you seem energized. What's changed? I stopped nestling Atticus against my cheek to frown at Courtney. I really didn't notice him? She bobbed her head to a Marley song as a soft breeze ripped through her bright Hawaiian shirt. Really? So what's your secret? Tabitha laughed, ducking her head. I looked between the two of them in confusion. My secret? I asked. Courtney waited until the noisy milk froth machine had turned off and then she nodded. Clearly, you've found a way to de-stress. What's your magic sauce? Tabitha snorted. Okay, yes, I've been stressed lately. Work has been crazy and there's so much pressure on me to acquire this boutique auction house. I'm juggling more things than ever and that doesn't even take into account that I adopted a cat who seems intent on destroying my furniture. Courtney gave me a meaningful look. Get your cat a scratching post. Oh, really? I asked, wondering if the answer was that simple. Yes, now tell me what changed your mood, Courtney said. His name is Turner, Tabitha said, winking at Courtney and resting her elbow on the counter, which was decorated with coconuts and tiny cocktail umbrellas in a rainbow of colors. Ah, I'm beginning to see, Courtney said. The name of my cat is Turner, I said, shooting Tabitha a thanks-a-lot look. That's what you mean, right? You're not talking about anything else. Fine, you naming your cat Turner is a total coincidence. Whatever. Tabitha raised her hands as if to profess innocence. I set Atticus down and accepted the coffee drink Courtney handed me. Thank you. I'll expect to hear more about Turner another time, Courtney said, winking before tending to her next customer. I looked at Tabitha, who giggled as we walked away. Thanks for that, I said. What? Tabitha said, shrugging. Sipping our coffees, we headed toward Carrie's kaleidoscope so I could pick up Turner, the cat, before heading into the office. Carrie's shop, which Tabitha managed, was located on a quaint little side street that looked like a magical tunnel of leafy green. A little bell rang as we stepped inside the world of quilted rainbows, glass raindrops, and artwork the color of the very best sunsets. It was a unique, cozy shop and we usually stepped inside to the aroma of herbal tea and soft music from an old gramophone. Instead, we stepped inside to the harsh crackling sounds of shattering glass. Oh, no! I cried as I surveyed the mess just past the door. What happened? One of the Christmas trees which had been decorated with Carrie's hand-blown glass ornaments lay toppled on the ground and it was more than obvious where the glass had come from. This was hundreds of dollars worth of damage and all I could do was stand in horror amongst the wreckage. The flicker of a white tail behind the still-standing Christmas tree was all it took to see that this was Turner's fault, aka my responsibility. Tabitha, I am so sorry. I said, trying to find an empty place to kneel to see if anything was salvageable. I'll pay for everything, Anne. Accidents happen, Tabitha said, waving a hand as she stepped over the mess. Don't worry about it. I was so surprised that I couldn't manage a word until she returned with a dustpan and broom. Did you say, don't worry about it? I asked. Tabitha nodded at my coffee. That's going to get cold if you keep staring at me with your mouth wide open like a fish instead of drinking it, she joked before she began sweeping. But I don't understand, I said, shaking my head. All this lost profit because of a cat you were watching for me. You must be at least a little upset. Tabitha stood, 
rested the broom against her hip, and pushed out the straps of her hand-tie-dyed overalls with her thumbs. She grinned at me, her purple lips curling up at the corners. What I don't understand, my dear friend, is why you seem to expect life to be perfect. I squeezed my coffee cup. I don't expect life to be perfect. Do I? Life happens, Martina, she said, gesturing at the floor. Your cat was obviously nervous being alone here, so I won't do that again. But look how beautiful the light looks on all the pieces of glass. It's like a mosaic. A happy, accidental, lovely mosaic. I'm going to make art out of it. I tilted my head back and forth, trying to see what she saw, wondering why I couldn't. This is life, my friend, she repeated. Imperfect and beautiful. Get it? Starting to, I said, since she was the second person to mention my need for perfection in under 24 hours. I was beginning to think they were onto something. It was strange staring down at my big desk calendar in the fading light of my office, the night before my final pitch to acquire, or not, a Keating for the Maxwell House. The square with the meeting time highlighted in yellow was everything I'd been working toward. I wanted to prove to my dad, and to myself, that I was capable of running this company successfully. As I stared down at the days after my pitch, I imagined what it would be like to fill in plans that I wanted to do, Napa with Turner? Try windsurfing for the first time with Turner? Do nothing at all on a rainy Sunday with Turner? And I didn't mean my cat. In my mind's eye the squares on the calendar began filling in with color, with sunshine, with breaking waves and brilliant sunsets and a special someone's warm hand around mine. It made the solitary appointment tomorrow that I'd highlighted and surrounded by asterisks lose some of its appeal. The appointment seemed like something I was dreading instead of something that I wanted to do. I wasn't sure when it happened, but the goals felt wrong now. Shaking my head, I covered my calendar and my silly dreams with my laptop. I had a long night ahead of me, after all. This was my last chance to prepare myself for presenting to Alexandra Keating. I knew she didn't want a stack of numbers, or a slideshow of reports. I had that night, and that night alone, to figure out exactly what she did want. I couldn't mess this up. I had to focus. I had to work. And yet before I knew it fifteen minutes had gone by and all I'd managed to accomplish was picturing the vivid blue of Turner's eyes in the candlelight of the tapas restaurant to go online and look up flights to Spain and to scribble an off-the-cuff itinerary of an imaginary road trip along the Costa del Sol. Get it together, Martina, I said, balling up the paper where I'd written ridiculous lists like spend a whole afternoon searching for seashells and wake up early to wander the markets with an espresso in hand. I threw the paper into the waste basket and hid the waste basket from view. Operation relaxation had apparently worked too well, because even though I knew the pitch was mere hours away, I felt no sense of urgency, no sweaty palms, no racing heart and no sense of impending doom despite my lack of preparation. What I needed, I realized without failing to catch the irony, was more stress to fuel my motivation through the night. I opened a new document on my laptop and titled it Pitch Ideas. Once that was done, I watched as the cursor blinked and the only thing I wanted to type was a list of restaurants downtown that I'd put off trying because I'd been too busy with work. And there was only one person I wanted to take to these restaurants. With a cry of desperation, I slammed shut my laptop just as someone knocked on my office door. I glanced up as my door opened and Turner walked in, looking incredibly sexy in dark washed jeans and a navy blue polo shirt that complimented his eyes. How did you get in here? I asked, and then shook my head. Adrian again? He's a good friend, Turner said, coming inside. He'll make an even better brother-in-law. My belly did a cartwheel, even though I was still stunned to see him here. I had the strong urge to tell him about the trip to Spain I'd planned. Instead, I blinked. Why are you here this late? 
I need you to come somewhere with me, he said, jerking his chin toward the hallway as if to say, hurry up, we've got life to live. But instead of jumping to my feet, I collapsed across my desk. I have so much work to do and it's not helpful having you here. Turner crossed the room, pulled back my chair, and wheeled me toward the door. What are you doing? I asked, exhilaration flowing through me. I desperately need you, sweetie, he said, stopping at the door, his blue eyes flashing mischievously. Will you come with me? I'm afraid you're not on my calendar this evening, I said, grinning. He gave me a sexy side glance that had my heart rate kicking up. I seem to recall making an appointment. I raised an eyebrow. Just like you booked a reservation at the spa? He broke out into a wide smile. And you remember how well that night turned out. I'm still detangling my hair, I said, wrinkling my nose and then laughing when he started running his fingers through my hair in a messy way. I jumped up. Enough help from you. He gave me a smirk. Sorry, I'm new to detangling. You desperately need me tonight, huh? I asked, stepping close to him and reaching for his hand, the air between his lips and mine growing thick, like crystallized honey. I could almost taste the sweetness. It is of the utmost importance, he whispered so earnestly it made me want to melt down to the floor. Well then, I suppose I could squeeze you in, I whispered. I would be eternally grateful. As a professional courtesy, I added. Yes, this business date will be very professional, he said, lacing his fingers through mine. No wistful gazing. He shook his head. None whatsoever. I raised my chin so that my mouth was mere inches from his. And absolutely no kissing. I'm not promising that, he said, his face breaking into a beaming, infectious smile as he pulled me out the door. Chapter 13 The tower bridge stood golden and gleaming in the balmy night air. Multicolored lights from the city, automobile lights, late-night office lights, and restaurant patios strung with Chinese lanterns reflected on the river, giving the impression that the bridge was a pier with a Ferris wheel and fireworks and cotton candy stands. Or maybe that was just my imagination, wanting to be back at that fair with Turner. As he and I walked, I expected us to take the pedestrian path along the bridge and wander into some quaint hole-in-the-wall place across the river so it was surprising when Turner stopped halfway and put his hands on his hips. This spot seems good to me. My forehead wrinkled as he surveyed the water below, tapped his foot against the hard walkway, and squinted up at the high peaks of the brightly illuminated bridge. What do you think? he asked, looking at me. Happy here? I laughed. Happy with what? He pulled his backpack around, unzipped it, and produced a red and white checkered blanket. For our romantic picnic, of course. A couple walking behind us gave us an odd look and scuttled around the blanket he'd unfolded and spread wide. Here? I asked checking both sides of the bridge. Is that even allowed? Kneeling on the blanket, he produced from his backpack a bottle of red wine. Would you like a glass? He asked, ignoring my previous question. A bicyclist darted by, giving us a bewildered look. Seeming to have no other choice, I sat down next to Turner, who was setting up a board of local cheeses and a baguette from Bernie's Bakery, which happened to be my favorite bakery in the city. Had he learned that from Adrian as well? I hoped he was paying him for all of the information he was getting. A pair of Rothley's auction house mugs joined the array on the picnic blanket and Turner grinned sheepishly. He glanced over at me. I figured this would be less conspicuous than wine glasses. When did you come up with this idea? I asked. He shrugged. Twenty minutes before I came to your office. Huh. Right when I'd been planning our trip to Spain. What were you doing before that? I asked. Trying to work, he said, handing me an appetizer plate and cocktail napkin. 
I was in my office and all I could think about was being on this bridge with you. I kept imagining what you would look like with your bare toes hanging over the edge and the breeze in your hair and the golden light on your skin. And the exhaust in my nose? I joked. Not romantic enough for you? He asked, holding his hands up. Very romantic, I said, smiling at him and accepting the rothly smug of red wine. You have quite the imagination. When I'm inspired, he said, flashing me a sexy grin. I was imagining all of this and couldn't quite get it right. I was certain what I was seeing in my mind was far too beautiful for reality. I was certain that I was being a ridiculous fool. I was certain that the you I imagined in my head couldn't possibly be real so I had to go steal you away to check. I took a sip of the velvety wine. And? You are more beautiful in person than in my imagination, he said, locking his gaze on mine. Then he reached out and twisted his finger around a strand of my hair the wind had tugged loose. So, you're not a fool then? I asked, in a soft voice that barely managed to scale the noise of the water, the wind, and the occasional car zooming by us. I'm definitely a fool, he said, tucking the strand behind my ear and cupping my cheek. I've fallen for a woman who doesn't realize this is our fourth date. I laughed, a soft, uncertain chuckle. Definitely not a business meeting. The gentleness of Turner's hand against my skin said everything. The steadiness of his gaze as he looked into my eyes said this was a date. For a few seconds, we looked at each other while an invisible cord seemed to pull us together. The moment he leaned toward me felt long-awaited and inevitable. When his mouth captured mine, something in my heart awakened like the morning sun and came to life, unpredictable, imperfect, wonderful life. My eyelashes fluttered closed as his fingers brushed my cheek and I leaned into him and opened my mouth, letting him taste me. Oh, wow, yum. Butterflies fluttered in my belly as our tongues danced together and he kissed me with a little more urgency. All of a sudden, my briefcase started buzzing and I froze. My eyes opened and I pulled back and even the traffic along the bridge seemed to slow, suspended in that fateful moment. The smile that spread across my face felt like the smile of a woman coming out of a dark cocoon and finding happiness for no other reason than that it felt so good. Turner watched me as I reached for my briefcase and then pushed it away, ignoring whatever message my cell phone was trying to communicate. Then I moved closer to him, slipping my hand behind his neck and playing with the soft hair at the back of his head. You were saying something, I believe, I whispered. Hmm, he said, a smile on his lips, was it something like, this? His lips met mine and the traffic whirled back to life, the breeze swept between us and the lights danced all around with life burning brightly as he kissed me again and again and again. Instead of waking up to a blaring alarm, I woke up to the sound of birds chirping and bright sunlight against my face. I snuggled into the lavender fragrance of my pillow and burrowed against the sheets, remembering my date with Turner the night before, the shimmering river, the reflected lights twisting like pinwheels, his lips against mine. A day of possibilities stretched out in front of me behind my closed, sun-soaked eyelids, starting with Turner and I taking a stroll through a garden lush with late summer blooms, followed by lounging on a hill of freshly trimmed grass beneath white and fluffy clouds shaped like hearts, sipping sangria on a dock, and our bare toes brushing against each other in cool water that sparkled like diamonds in the golden afternoon rays. The sun from my open bedroom window warmed my cheek and I was reminded of the fluttering of my heart as Turner lowered his face to mine amongst the Russian cars. A smile tugged up the corners of my mouth and I considered laying there for hours, letting the sunlight move across every inch of me at its own lazy, contented pace. Then I realized there shouldn't be sun on my face at 6 o'clock in the morning, the time I was supposed to get up and get ready for my final pitch to Alexandra for the acquisition of a Keating, the time I purposely set my alarm for in order to be prepared. I groped around my nightstand and then under my pillow until I procured my cell phone with sweaty palms and a rapidly beating heart. The sun was no longer a friend, but an enemy who had snuck into my room unannounced. I dimly recalled, like a memory from long ago, a buzzing from my phone in my briefcase. 
I squeezed my eyes shut in mounting panic as I imagined the message my phone had been trying to communicate. Battery level low. Plug me in, Martina. Or else. I remembered ignoring the buzzing in favor of Turner and his lips, which had been inching closer and closer to mine. I remembered returning home and falling into bed with a giddy laugh and a phone I didn't even check to see if it was fully charged. Fumbling for the charger, I plugged my phone in and waited to see what time would appear on the screen. It was pure anguish waiting and waiting, until... 8.16. No, no, no. I cried as I launched out of bed, eyes wide and heart pounding frantically. No, this can't be happening. My pitch to Alexandra Keating was at 8.30. My brain tried to prioritize what I had time to do in the three minutes before I needed to be out the door in order to have a chance of making the meeting on time since it was all the way across town. Wrongly or rightly, I decided on, a quick teeth brushing, a massive swig of mouthwash, a splash of cold water on the face, a bra with the least number of hooks, hopefully clean clothes, and a few seconds devoted to making sure that the shoes I pulled from my closet were a matching pair. I raced to my car with my briefcase swinging at my side, hopping into one heel, tugging a hairbrush through my hair and being reminded of when I'd been running late to my blind date. Thankfully, it wasn't raining right now. After zooming across town, I pulled up in front of the boutique with a screech of tires and then a quick wave of the mascara wand over my eyelashes. I'd been in such a rush to get to the appointment that I hadn't had time to worry about how unprepared I was, how I was putting my job at the Maxwell House in jeopardy, and how foolish I'd been wasting my precious hours on a bridge instead of in the office. What had I been thinking? but the thoughts I'd escaped came rushing in just as I spotted Turner, standing outside the boutique in his relaxed demeanor, and with his easy smile as he sipped a cup of coffee, his eyes meeting mine as I hurtled out of the car. Good morning, Martina, he said, which was odd considering he wasn't due to pitch for another hour. Is it a good morning? I asked, knowing that if I lingered by him, I'd catch the scent of his cologne and be dragged back to the bridge the night before. I'd remember his lips on mine, our hands intertwined, and our laughter. But at this moment, I wished I could go all the way back to the night in the crowded restaurant where I fell into his arms, the only chance I ever stood of pushing him away, of not setting up these dominoes in this inevitable way, and of not watching them all fall around me. I sensed his confusion as I rushed past him into the boutique without stopping. But I couldn't face him, couldn't admit that I was a frazzled mess, and that I'd woken up, or started waking up, mere minutes earlier. I couldn't let him see that I didn't stand a chance in front of Alexandra Keating since I wasn't prepared. I couldn't let him know that I'd chosen him over my work, over my father's company, over my success. I couldn't let him know that I feared I'd chosen wrong. Chapter 14 Whenever you're ready, Martina, Alexandra Keating said, crossing one leg over the other in a long, black skirt and lowering her funky neon pink frames to the tip of her nose. Yes, thank you, I said, as she seemed to assess me from across the room with her pencil poised over a clipboard, which rested on her knee. The problem was that I wasn't ready. I was as flustered as my staticky hair, half-asleep brain, and worried I might have blue tinge from my mouthwash around my hastily lipstick-smeared lips, turned out red lights can be good. As a person who didn't feel ready to go to something as simple as the grocery store without a list organized by aisle, cross-referenced by meal, and containing a list of alternatives should some item be momentarily unstocked, I felt out of my depth. Take your time, Martina, Alexandra said, laying her pencil flat against the clipboard and steepling her fingers beneath her chin. Thank you so much. I nodded, my throat tightening more and more with every click of the second hand on the mid-century modern clock against the wall behind Alexandra. I struggled to recall even just the first topic I had intended to present on behalf of the Maxwell House, but all my mind could focus on was how I'd ignored that buzzing of my phone while on the bridge with Turner. Why hadn't I checked it? Why hadn't I made sure my phone was charged before falling asleep? Why hadn't I been prepared? I knew the answer, of course. He was waiting outside, to swoop in after my failure. 
Let's me just consult my notes, I said, feeling mortified. She nodded her consent as I dashed to my briefcase and opened it. Inside, I found the empty bottle of wine from the night before, the flowers Turner had picked for me as he walked me home, a coaster from the Little Tapas restaurant where we shared a surprise night, and the napkin from the ice creams we shared on the bleachers at the fair. Beside all of that, sat a stack of my unfinished notes for the presentation. I pulled the note cards away from all those reminders of Turner and hurried back to my spot in the center of the room. I'm sorry for the delay, I said, my cheeks heating. Just be yourself, Alexandra said, in a calm voice, though the fact that her eyes were on me sent pressure to my shoulders like never before. Here we go, I said, as I flipped over the stack. As I gazed at the first card, the feeling drained from my face. I wasn't staring at the list of pros from the Maxwell House acquiring a keying that I'd worked so hard to outline. Instead, I was staring down at a stack of recipes I'd printed out with the whimsical, unpractical, irresponsible dream of cooking for Turner in Spain. One after the other I flipped through the cards that held the key to cooking authentic Spanish tapas, but I didn't hold the key to winning points with Alexandra Keating. Without my note cards, I was completely on my own. No charts. No outlines. No reports. No PowerPoint presentations. Just me and the words in my head and heart. My arm fell limply to my side as I gripped the recipe cards and stared at Alexandra in horror. I imagined my father hearing that I'd lost a Keating to Rothlis. Worse, I imagined having to tell him. Would I just come straight out and tell him? Would I beat around the bush, or hope that he'd just guess eventually and spare me the pain? Would I break down in tears at having let him down? I, um, I. Alexandra leaned forward. Martina? I'd been so terrified of making a mistake that I'd become petrified, unable to make a choice, unable to make a decision. So, it was no surprise that I'd been swept away by a force like a rushing river. I had no legs to kick with, no arms to swim with. Turner had carried me away and now I was watching my dream fall away from me. I'm sorry, I said, feeling like every word that came into my head wouldn't be good enough. And like that day I'd seen Alexandra waiting for me in the lounge, I wanted to run away, but, unfortunately, she'd already seen me. Heat flooded my cheeks and tears filled my eyes. I just... I just can't do this. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I dropped the recipes and hurried from the room. I burst through the front doors of the boutique and Turner immediately came to my side. Short and sweet, he said, before he noticed the tears brimming in my eyes. He closed his mouth and reached for me. What's wrong? Leave me alone, I said, hurrying past him. At least I still had one last choice to make for myself, to run, far away. Martina, Turner said, his voice filled with concern. Maybe running away from him was a mistake, too, but it was one I was going to make. I didn't stop when he called my name again, I just ran faster down the sidewalk and away from my huge and epic failure. I didn't know if anything could make me feel better after completely blowing the Maxwell House's chance of purchasing a Keating, but I figured an adorable puppy, a sugary coffee drink topped with heaps of whipped cream, and a friendly face was the best chance. Tropical music greeted my slumped shoulders and downturned face as I approached Courtney's coffee cart, and she immediately reached beneath the counter to produce a bottle of the good stuff as I flopped my head down on her counter. Whatever it is, she said, as I groaned into the hard surface. We're going to make it better. Impossible, I said, with a bitter moan, before I lifted my head. I've failed and that's that. I'm no good as a businesswoman. No good as a CEO. No good as an art auction house buyer. Courtney laughed and patted my cheek. Sorry you had a difficult morning. Are you looking for a second barista? I asked, remembering that she'd given up practicing law for making coffee and she'd never been happier. 
I can provide excellent references. Up off the counter, she said, making a motion with her finger. Come on now. Would it be so wrong if I stayed there forever? I asked, standing up as she handed me her tiny pooch and a cup of key lime pie flavored whipped cream for my other hand. You want a spoon with that? she asked. I shook my head. No, I said, licking straight from the frothy peak. The whipped cream got all over my nose, but what did it even matter? Failures should have to wear whipped cream all over their face. Clean faces were for winners. Now that your arms are filled with happiness, tell me what happened, Courtney said, leaning back against her cart and adjusting her little fan to blow on her bright cheeks. I told her all about Turner, the cat and the man, the pitch, the bridge, the phone, my hurried morning and my failure. When I was done, Courtney nodded, refilled my whipped cream, scratched Atticus behind the ear and rested her elbows on the counter in front of me. You know, I wouldn't be here where I am, doing what I love, without a failure of my own, she said playing with a little drink umbrella. I turned my attention away from Atticus's little wet nose to look at Courtney with a raised eyebrow. Surely not a failure as bad as mine, I said. Worse, she said, laughing. My husband had left me, claiming that I worked too much and didn't pay attention to him. I was still a lawyer at the time and was assigned to help the firm with a huge satellite case in Los Angeles. It was the perfect time to bury myself in work. Because you were sad that your husband left? No, because work was all I knew, she said, lifting an eyebrow. So, I worked nonstop on this case. Bone tired, I booked my flight for the trial. I arrived at the airport, juggled three calls before the flight, finalized a pleading, and sorted through the binders of evidence. I boarded with my head buried in the laptop. You must have nailed that case, I said, giving Atticus a nuzzle. I hope that's the bright light at the end of your tail. She shook her head. It wasn't until the flight attendant told me to put my tray table away for takeoff that I heard the pilot wish us a pleasant flight to Hawaii. As you can imagine, they did not fulfill my request to turn the plane around. I gasped. What did you do? What could I do? She shrugged, wiping down the counter. For five hours, I panicked, mentally kicked myself over and over, and anguished over how I'd blown my career. Sounds about right, I said, totally relating. When we landed, I was intent on sprinting to the earliest flight back, she said, lifting her lashes and looking me in the eye. But I stepped off the plane and was hit with warm, humid air and the lushness of the island washed over me. I ordered a cup of coffee, sat down on a patio with an ocean view and before I knew it the whole day had gone by, ending with me watching the sunset and deciding to forget legal work forever. It wasn't making me happy. I can't quit my job, I said, the thought making my heart break. That's not what I'm saying, she said, offering more of key lime pie whipped cream, but I shook my head. All I'm saying is that mistakes are not mistakes. It's the universe making you aware of something. What you do with that information, well, that's your choice. My choice is to be unprepared? I asked, handing Atticus back to Courtney. That's depressing. Just think about it, she said, moving to tend to a customer who walked up. Will do, I said, waving my hand and walking to my car. Courtney's words rattled around in my head as I drove to Carrie's kaleidoscope to pick up Turner. Without the new acquisition, I'd have more time for my destructive little rescue cat. I walked into the quaint, cozy store in a daze and didn't realize I'd walked into a rainbow. Turner Jr. came to weave between my legs as I stared at the floor dotted with color like a field of mountain flowers. In total confusion, I looked over my shoulder to find the windows above and on either side of the door covered with shards of glass. What do you think? Tabitha asked, as she emerged from the storeroom with her rescue wrapped lazily around her neck. 
She stopped beside me in overalls that were hand-painted with sunflowers and stared up at her artwork with a contented smile, like the sun itself was smiling on her face. Courtney's words echoed in my head, mistakes are not mistakes. The colors from the broken glass played across my face like a kaleidoscope, filling my heart and soul with their beauty. Well? Tabitha said, nudging me with an elbow. Sorry, what's that? I asked, shaking my head clear. Or trying to. Mistakes are not mistakes. What do you think, silly? Tabitha laughed. I smiled over at her as Turner Jr.'s tail brushed against my leg. I think I need to make a call. Chapter 15 Outside Carrie's kaleidoscope the trees were swaying in the late morning breeze, casting little shadows of confetti across the sidewalk. I kicked at it with my toes as I held my phone, charged to 15%, against my ear. Hi, Alexandra, I said, taking a deep breath for bravery. I wasn't even sure that you would pick up, to be honest. She chuckled into the phone. Well, to be honest, Martina, I wasn't sure you would call. Despite accepting what had happened and the role it played in pushing life forward, I still felt my cheeks heat as I stood there on the sidewalk. Because I ran away and didn't look back? I asked, surprised to hear humor in my voice. She laughed. Something like that. I smiled. I've been doing a lot of that recently. Running away? Yes, I took a deep breath, ready to be honest because that's all I had left in me. After taking over as CEO of my dad's company, I've been so afraid of failure that I've avoided making decisions. I thought if I didn't make a decision then I couldn't make the wrong one. But I've learned that not making a decision also means I won't make the right one. I see, she said. What I'm trying to say is that if you entrust a keying to me, I won't be perfect, I said, finally listening to my heart instead of my head. As you've seen clearly firsthand, I'm going to make mistakes. She laughed and it felt good to admit I wasn't perfect, to relieve myself of that pressure, and to accept a mistake with a smile. Also, you should know I get caught up in small details. I find security in numbers and charts and reports, but I also plan to start relying on my gut, my instinct, and my heart, I said, pausing a moment to take a breath. I'd called Alexandra with a sort of blueprint, apologize, explain the situation, ask for a second chance. But I'd dug a little too deep into my heart, which had caused a geyser of truth to burst loose. I missed the initial meeting with you because I wanted to impress you so badly that I felt intimidated after seeing you waiting for me. So, I walked around the block to build up courage, afraid of stepping inside and saying the wrong thing. Is that so? She said. Yes, I'm sorry to say. I paced back and forth on the sidewalk, each step becoming more and more determined. By the time I went inside you were gone, which was completely my fault. To be honest, Alexandra, my failure this morning in your boutique was the last of many failures that started when I fell in a restaurant many weeks ago and thought the man who caught me was my blind date. I failed to stop looking at him all that night. I failed trying to avoid him when I discovered he was my biggest rival in acquiring your boutique. I failed to stop my heart from pounding when he raced us around the go-kart track. I failed to stop my heart from catching when he held my hand in the candlelight of a hidden away restaurant, and I failed to stop my heart from falling in love when he kissed me on that bridge last night. I bit my lip, knowing I'd revealed way more than she probably wanted to know, but it felt so good to put it all out there. I was done pretending to be anything other than who I was and this was the only kind of stress relief for me. You know my reputation in the art world, I said, knowing that I'd long ago proved myself to my colleagues and to my dad which was how I got this position to begin with. In all my worry about making mistakes, I'd lost my confidence and now I had it back. My work is stellar and my track record speaks for itself. I'm giving you all of this personal information to explain my unusual actions this past month. 
I want you to be comfortable with our purchase of your auction house so you can enjoy retirement assured that the business you built is in good hands. I will see to that personally, I promise. A long stretch of silence ensued. Well, Alexandra said, now that I'd given her a chance to actually speak. That was. A lot. I said, letting out a little laugh. What I was hoping to hear all along, she said. My mouth fell open. Really? I made so many mistakes. You were honest, she said, her tone amused. I admire that about you. Art is nothing if not honest. Or, at least it should be. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I nodded, my heart threatening to leap straight out of my chest. Yes, I agree. If it's all right with you, Martina, Alexandra said, in her calm voice. I'm going to forget about this morning and consider this grand speech as your official pitch. Oh. Um, I had to fight back the urge to insist I be given time to reorganize my thoughts, to file them into a table of contents, to give the whole thing a bit of coherency. But I was making mistakes and I was making them honestly so I nodded. All right, thank you so much. Good, she said. Please tell Turner Easton that I'd like the both of you to be at my office in one hour for my final decision. Turner? I said, biting my bottom lip, knowing I had to be the last person he wanted to see or hear from. Well, I'm not sure where he is. I trust your ability to locate him, she said, before hanging up. Hello? Alexandra? Um, Ms. Keating? I said, into the dead phone. I don't have any idea where Turner is. I do, came a familiar male voice from behind me. I whirled around to find Turner standing there, his hands in his pockets as he came toward me. You're here? Right where I should be, he said, his gaze intent on mine. Right by your side. But I've acted like a crazy person, I said, before realizing I was arguing against my own case. I've made terrible mistakes with you, over and over. Nobody's perfect, he said, a smile on his lips. You sure you're not perfect? I asked, staring up at this wonderful man. He raised an eyebrow. What are you saying? I stepped closer to him. You're perfect for me. Glad to hear it, he said, pulling me close. Besides, what kind of mistake could you make that would be so terrible? He whispered, his fingers finding mine. My terrible, horrible, irrevocable mistake of not kissing you good morning. He grinned. I think we should rectify the situation, sweetie. Happy to make amends, I said, lifting up onto my tiptoes and kissing him, fully and honestly, with all of the love inside me. Chapter 16 Turner and I walked into a Keating auction house together and passed through the front display rooms with our fingers intertwined, mine clammy and sweaty and somehow both hot and cold, and his cool, steady, strong. We went down the long hallway toward Alexandra's office and Turner squeezed my hand tighter as my heart leaped in my chest at the sound of Alexandra on the phone. I released his hand just before we stepped into the office. Alexandra held up a finger to indicate she was almost finished with her call, almost ready to address us with her full attention, almost ready to deliver her decision about which art auction house would acquire a Keating, the Maxwell House or Rothley's. When she hung up the phone, she indicated for us both to sit and Turner sank casually into a leather chair and I took the one beside him. Welcome back, Martina and Turner, she said, steepling her fingers. We've certainly made things interesting, now haven't we? Sorry about that, I said, knowing she must be talking about my earlier call. Making the statement as we was her simply being a polite businesswoman. I made quite a mess of things, didn't I? Turner said. I raised an eyebrow. What the? He didn't tell you? Alexandra asked, looking at me. 
I shook my head. Tell me what? Alexandra adjusted her funky frames and eyed Turner with a narrowed look that didn't affect the small grin on her burgundy-painted lips. Turner started his presentation this morning by spilling coffee all over my white rug. I glanced down to see that the rug was missing from the office. Again, I apologize. I was distracted, his grin looked cool and confident to me, and in no way would have revealed his oopsie moment earlier with his coffee. Then he spent the first fifteen minutes explaining how none of the art in my auction house was worth as much as a piece titled, Portrait of Polaris on the Bridge, though he refused to tell me the name of the artist when I pressed. It took all I had to keep my back straight and my hands folded in my lap. This was my second chance and I needed to keep it together. But, Polaris? The bridge? Turner grinned. I'm afraid that I stand by my assessment, Alexandra. She smiled and eyed Turner over her frames. I should certainly hope so. I looked between Alexandra and Turner in growing bewilderment. What in the world was going on? Could Turner have bombed his presentation even worse than I had? Could he have done that on purpose so I wouldn't look so bad? Finally, Turner told me numbers weren't his strength and he could have a hard time focusing on the task at hand if something inspiring drew him away, she said. I gawked in disbelief at the smooth, charming, always calm man who had captured my heart. What, he said, the corners of his mouth twitching. She asked me to be honest about my weaknesses. I appreciate that, Alexandra said, removing her glasses with a sigh and pinching the bridge of her nose, but when she looked up she was smiling. Neither of you made particularly compelling business reasons for me to entrust a keating to your hands, she said. And I realized after your rather frantic and impassioned call, Martina, that I was not going to pick one of you, Anne. Alexandra, you're making a mistake, I said, leaning forward in my seat. My stomach dropped even though I couldn't say this was unexpected. I'd run out after more than a few stuttered words and then call to spray my personal issues at her like confetti. I couldn't blame her for not wanting to sort through that mess. But to not choose Turner? I'm not sure what Turner's talking about with the bridge portrait, but I do know that your auction house would be in fantastic hands with Rothleys. Turner gave me a look. Martina. Now, I was already standing. Turner is smart, dedicated and he has a way of seeing the world that's impassioned in a unique vision that can't be surpassed. Martina, he said, a crease forming between his eyebrows. Please stop. No, I said, knowing it was probably a mistake speaking up for him like this. But it was a mistake I wanted to make. It was a mistake I was going to make. Frankly, I can understand that you have reservations about my capabilities due to my temporary problem-making decisions. But spilled coffee could happen to anyone. I'll pay for the rug myself. There is no buyer better for a Keating than Rothleys. It would be foolish to choose otherwise. Turner's eyes widened and he pressed his fingers to his mouth, as if biting back a response. Alexandra, however, seemed to assess me as if she'd seen a whole new side of me. Is that all? she asked. My cheeks flooded with warmth, like all the embarrassment had been held back by a dam that was finally breaking under her firm gaze. I sank back down into my chair, folded my hands neatly over my lap, and nodded. I'm sorry for interrupting, but that needed to be said. Alexandra stood from her desk, walked around to the front, and leaned against the edge. If you would have let me finish, Martina, she said, slowly, carefully, with what I thought was a smile growing on her lips, I was going to say I had decided not to pick one of you, but instead decided to pick both of you. All I could do was stare at Alexandra in disbelief. You're picking both of us? Yes, because although I myself have made mistakes upon occasion, I am not foolish at all she said, looking from Turner to me, before holding her hands up. I'm aware that you've both excelled in your field, but the two of you have special individual skill sets that together are what is best for my boutique. 
Thank you, Turner said, standing and holding his hand out. She took his hand and gripped it in her own. Just like a painting needs highlights and lowlights for depth, my company needs both of you. I understand it's a rather untraditional approach and it would require a formal agreement, but I don't want my boutique to be run traditionally. I want it to be run spectacularly. She finished by raising her arms, smiling, and sighing. I stared at her, still not quite believing what I was hearing. Alexandra then raised an amused eyebrow. But, she said, looking at me and grinning, if you think I should just sell to Rothley's alone. No, I blurted, standing up and shaking her hand. I mean. I looked over at Turner who smiled like he'd been waiting this entire time for me to look over at him, like the acquisition didn't matter as much as seeing me happy mattered. I mean, I know we can run your auction house together, I said, smiling at Alexandra and then at Turner. I felt proud and couldn't wait to tell my dad about this partnership. Epilogue Six months later, Turner and I were lost, again. But this time it wasn't me who was losing it, dropping things onto the sidewalk, spinning in circles while gripping my hair as if the whole world were ending. This time, it was Turner. Honey, I said, laughing as we walked to the end of another intersection and Turner's head swiveled right and then left, his eyes wide like a bewildered owl's. It's fine. Do you need me to bring back Operation Relaxation? I'm glad my turmoil amuses you, he said, checking his cell phone for the fifth time, which, like the previous four times, was still completely dead. I can't believe I forgot to charge my phone, he said, whipping around and marching back the way we had just come. That's definitely not something I've ever done, I said, hurrying after my normally calm, cool and collected boyfriend. It was nice to see him lose it for once. Seriously, though, what has gotten into you? I asked, threading my arm through his. Getting lost can be fun. The sunset is absolutely spectacular. The neighborhood smells like lilac. And the breeze couldn't be more soothing. A Keating is doing better than ever, so I know your stress has nothing to do with work. But Turner's only response was to check his sporty wristwatch, crane his head in the opposite direction, and then pick up the pace. I placed my other hand on his chest to find his heart rate leaping like salmon swimming upstream in sparkling waters. I mean we had been walking around in circles for a while and the neighborhood was a bit hilly, but still. Turner, I said, trying again to be the voice of reason. If you're that hungry, we pass like three places back there. The Italian restaurant didn't look half bad and it smelled like garlic. Very authentic. Besides, it doesn't matter that we're lost, it's about being together, isn't it? No, he said, letting out a groan. It's about. I waited, but he didn't finish. It's about what? He pressed his lips together and gave me a darting glance. Let's try this way, he said, turning left in a hurry. You're lucky I was a basket case when we started dating, otherwise I'd have to say you're acting crazy, I said, noticing the sky turn a deep lavender as Turner marched on, shaking his hands at the sky and claiming he was going to throw his cell phone into the river the first chance he got. No drama. Oh! I exclaimed, stopping on the sidewalk beside what he had to be looking for. I smiled and laughed, cupping my hands around my mouth and calling out to him, Honey, stop. He spun around, his blonde hair a tousled mess, his eyes wide, and his cheeks flushed. He looked ruggedly handsome. I thumbed to the right. Is that what you were looking for? I asked. He pressed his palms to his forehead before he hurried back and then we were standing side by side in front of the warmly lit restaurant tucked away behind a secret garden of spring blooms. Exactly where we'd been that fateful night. Turner laced his fingers through mine. His hands were warm like the sand on a sunny beach. What do you think? I asked, grinning up at him. Should we give it a try? 
Finally, he said, dragging a hand over his face. Do you think they have outlets to charge a cell phone? He asked. I drummed my chin. Only one way to find out. He held open the wrought iron gate for me and we walked across the mosaic path and into the restaurant. A server guided us to the same table we'd shared by the window. Candles danced to the soft guitar music and there was a warmth that didn't come from the wood-burning fire. One of everything? The server asked, pouring the same red wine we shared that night. One of everything, we replied at the same time before laughing as she zipped away. I can't believe she remembers us. I sat down, placed a napkin in my lap, and smiled at Turner. Ah, this is why you were so. Like you, he joked, lifting his glass of wine and waiting for me to do the same. Two, what did you call it? Being in a state of frazzlement? It's a real thing. I nodded, clinking my glass into his. To defrazzling. You said it, sweetie, he said, taking a long sip. I'm sorry for losing my cool. So like I used to be, I said, waving my hand and breathing in deeply, happily. You need to let go sometimes. Don't think of it as a mistake, think of it as a sign, I added with a wink. He fidgeted with the stem of his wine glass. I wanted everything to be perfect, he said. I raised an eyebrow. Perfect for. Oh, a cat! Wait a minute, that's my cat. Turner Jr., what are you doing here? Turner met my gaze and shrugged. Flinging my chair back, I scooped up Turner Jr. who had wandered in from the back of the restaurant. Did you bring him here? Honey, you're going to get us kicked out, I said, laughing as my cat nestled his face against my neck. I was about to face Turner, the man, not the cat, when I felt something hard on Turner Jr.'s collar. Leafing through his fur, my breath caught when a sparkle flashed off a dazzling diamond ring. What the? I spun around to find Turner, the human, not the cat, down on one knee. Yes, I brought him here. I wanted this to be perfect. My eyes blurred as I held Turner Jr. against my pounding heart. I didn't need it to be perfect, I said, my throat tightening. I just need it to be with you. I'm glad you finally came around, he said, his face breaking out into a broad smile. From the first moment I saw you, my heart was yours. A tear slipped down my cheek. I was a mess. You were breathtaking, he said, his tone thick with emotion. When I saw you come into that restaurant, I knew I had to meet you. I came over to introduce myself and you literally fell into my arms. Not a mistake, I said, smiling through my tears. Will you marry me? he asked, looking sweet and vulnerable and like his life depended on my answer. Yes, I will, I said, biting my bottom lip. You'll be my wife, he asked, as if needing to make sure he wasn't dreaming. Nothing would make me happier, I said, looking into those beautiful blue eyes. But I have a secret to tell you. What? he asked, looking momentarily worried as he stood, cupping my face in his hands as if he thought I might change my mind. No chance of that. We're honeymooning in Spain, I said. He let out a breath. Is that the secret? I nodded. There are spreadsheets, itineraries, and maps. Now all I need is for you to make it official, I joked. This was the part where he was supposed to slip the ring onto my finger, but he stared at his empty hand and then at the ring still hooked onto Turner Jr.'s collar. We both broke out into laughter at the situation. Um, how do we get the ring off? I asked. I honestly didn't think that far ahead, he said, pressing his lips to mine. That makes it official. It certainly does, I said, kissing him again. He tasted of wine, happiness, and love. 
After the sweetest kiss ever, I gazed into those blue eyes before burying my face against his chest and smiling. I was sure we would figure out how to get the ring from the cat. I was sure we could figure anything out, together. The End If you enjoyed spending time with these characters, be sure to read Tabitha's story in the Decadent Date, Do Over Date series, 10. You have been listening to The Date Mistake, Do Over Date series, Book 9, by Susan Hatler, copyright 2022 by Susan Hatler, audiobook copyright 2024 by Susan Hatler. Susan Hatler is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author who writes humorous and emotional women's fiction and young adult novels. Many of Susan's books have been translated into German, Spanish, French, and Italian. A natural optimist, she believes life is amazing, people are fascinating, and imagination is endless. She loves spending time with her characters and hopes you do, too.